right. Looks like we are live, everybody. Welcome to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's debate between Jamie from the Studio Studio 215 YouTube channel and Grayson from Based Theory. Tonight, we are debating Big Bang to Evolution. Now, we have a lot of discussion. We have a lot to get through in tonight's important debate as we are covering everything from, again, as the title would say, Big Bang to Evolution. And so how we are going to structure tonight is we are going to have five-minute intros, one could say. We're going to start with Jamie, where he is going to present his first argument. And then we're going to have Grayson and Jamie go back and forth on that a little bit. And then we're just going to go that way. Argument two, three, four, and so on. Jamie's got slides for each. So, Jamie, we're just going to kind of hand it over to you, my good man, and allow you to have that first five minutes for for an intro in, into the debate. All right. So, yeah, um, I guess we're just going to go straight into the presentation then. Let me go ahead and uh, switch over to the slides. Um, I'll be... Uh, blowing it up and making it smaller as needed so that people can read along with the slides. Um, but essentially we're going to be talking about the six stages of evolution. I know Grayson is going to be pulling his hair out because he wants to believe that they are not six stages. They're completely different theories and they're not tied to each other, but they are. And that's what we're debating today. So let's go ahead and just uh, start from the beginning with uh, evolution exposed. Now I did um, take this, let me go back here for a second. Um, this is actually the whole reason that this debate started was he saw my video evolution exposed on my channel. Um, I haven't posted in a while because I've actually evolution exposed episode three turned into a documentary. So uh, that's why I haven't posted in a while for those that have been wondering. Um, but this was the first video in my evolution exposed series. Grayson watched it and he said, this is what I want to debate you on. So this is what we're going over. I took out a couple of slides just because they don't really fit the debate format. Uh, and then we're just going to go straight through it from there. <clears throat> so a quick summary of evolution, nothing exploded, turned into all the stars and planets. Those stars and planets started off as hot balls of rock. It rained on those rocks for millions of years. And then we got the planet earth, but there's no life on it yet. We just have the prebiotic soup or primordial soup, whatever you want to call it. From there, the primordial soup gave us our first living creature, I guess you can call it. And then that created everything. That's essentially the summary of evolution. As much as they want to say that's not what evolution teaches, that's exactly what evolution teaches, uh, almost word for word in their science books. Um, so is this, uh, is evolution scientific? I would say absolutely not. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here. Um, so I guess let's just go ahead and skip through some of this. Here's what we're going to be going over. Um, I figure I'll let him kind of have a response since I did a little introduction, and then we'll just go through each one of these stages one by one. So we'll start with cosmic, then we'll go to chemical, then we'll switch over to stellar, organic, macro. And for micro, if we even make it that far, I figured since we both already agree that micro evolution is real, it's really just variations. It's not actually evolution. Um, but since we already agree on stage six, I know he wanted to talk about clammy demonis. So if we do get to make it to stage six, we'll just switch over to my clammy demonis presentation and go through that. Um, so yeah, go ahead and uh, switch over to him and then let him have a few words and we'll get back to it. Jamie, appreciate it. Grayson, we're going to give you, uh, let's just say two to three minutes, same amount of time Jamie took for a few words of introduction. And then we are just going to uh, jump right into tonight's epic showdown. Grayson, go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Grayson. I just recently started my YouTube channel to have like debates like this and other topics um, based theory. So just today, actually, I'm pretty proud to say that just hit over a, a hundred subscribers. Um, so I'm pretty grateful for everyone that subscribed so far. So um, yeah, hopefully I want to do more after shows, more debates and more content like this. So first of all, um, Jamie, Donnie already know that I, I disagree with this whole model of the six stages of evolution, right? Uh, macro and micro evolution are just the theory of evolution, right? And those other uh, so-called cosmic, chemical, stellar evolution 
Um, those are all described by different theories of science. It's not that these are different stages for the theory of evolution umbrella. The theory of evolution just describes the origin of species um, and biodiversity. It doesn't explain where life came from, doesn't explain how stars formed, doesn't understand, uh, explain how the universe came to be. You know, we're going to be talking about all those things. But my stance, I just wanted to articulate at the beginning because Jamie and I have already gone back and forth on this quite a lot. And I already I feel pretty confident in saying that no matter what I say, no matter what dictionary definitions I show him, he's never going to change. Uh, he's going to continue to say that these are all just parts of the singular theory of evolution. And he will not accept um, that the theory of evolution is just for biodiversity and species. Um, so it is what it is. What we're actually going to be talking about is uh, multiple different theories and hypotheses. The Big Bang Theory, um, stellar evolution, which is just the name of the theory. It doesn't have anything to do with biological evolution. And then um, like we're talking about a nucleosynthesis, abiogenesis, the solar nebular hypothesis, so all kinds of different topics. But I just wanted to at the start say that only you know stages five and six on his on his little roadmap there is actually the theory of a revolu of evolution so we're going to be talking about all the other stages but that's just kind of the format we're going to be holding for the sake of the conversation tonight so i just wanted to preface it a bit about saying these are a lot of different scientific different scientific theories that we're going to be discussing tonight Grayson, appreciate the introduction. Also, Jamie, thank you for your introduction. This uh, sets the foundation nicely for what we are going to discuss, the six stages of evolution, which Grayson uh, disagrees with. And we're going to have a lot of great discussion on that. Tonight might just make or break this uh, long-lasting uh, friendship between Grayson and Jamie, <laughs> Battle of the Buds tonight. So what we're going to do is uh, throw it back to Jamie. Jamie, to uh, cover the first point for tonight. Before you do, I want to notify the audience, since this is more free-flowing uh, than formal, as the debaters are discussing each relevant point, I'll be watching the chat and saving questions. So we will make sure to get a bit of a Q&A period in there. So Jamie, floor is yours again. Yeah, so I'll just go ahead and go full screen with my slides for the time being and you know if i am you know talking too long i guess just you know stop me and let grayson jump in i don't want to hog the mic so to say um so of course we're going to go through the six stages uh, as much as he wants to disagree on it um that's what he that's what the initial agreement was on so that's what we're going to be doing now for cosmic evolution uh for those of y'all that are looking here this uh chart is from a professor at Harvard University. And when you read the book that's tied to this chart, it is actually backed by NASA data. So uh, as far as Harvard and NASA are concerned, evolution does entail from the Big Bang to humankind. So as he said earlier, cosmic to micro, they're all different theories. But according to Harvard and NASA, they are all one theory. Um, now, Harvard and NASA apparently wants to combine them all into the title of cosmic evolution. Um, but cosmic evolution itself, we just kind of use that to describe the Big Bang. Um, so uh, I'm not going to you know, run you all through my entire script. I'm just going to kind of scroll through some of this stuff. Me and him both don't agree on Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, so we'll skip through all of that. Now, the three big problems with the Big Bang obviously is where did time, space, and matter come from? Uh, because everything that their theory holds on is that everything was in this infinitesimal dot. But when you listen to the professors explain this, they say at time 0 0.001 or whatever the number they come up with that year, that it's not the beginning. So I guess the real question is, what is the beginning? How did that dot come into existence? That's their first problem. Uh, the second problem is laws of thermodynamics. I know what his answer is going to be, but I'm going to let him answer it, and then we'll go back and forth on that. Um, but yeah, laws of thermodynamics are not um, held up by the Big Bang Theory. In fact, the Big Bang Theory goes against all of the laws of thermodynamics. Um, and then three, uh, does it violate the laws of physics? 
for that, I like to use one example specifically. He knows which example I'm going to be bringing up. So we'll start with that one, the conservation of angular momentum. Um, Jamie, um, let's go ahead and get, pause there for you. Yeah, yeah, before we get to that point, can you go back to your little chart that you showed on cosmic evolution? Yep. And um, again, I, I didn't delete all my slides, so I'm going to be skipping through a lot of stuff just because it fits. Yeah. I, so I don't want to redo I, I my think entire that it's a little bit misleading to say that this comes from Harvard or NASA, as those institutions are not putting this out. This is from the personal blog and website of Eric Chasen, who has worked for these institutions, but he's not putting this out connected like to those institutions. This is not part of their literature. It's not something that's being taught in their class. This is his own. He wrote a book about it. And I mean, this is his own personal website that he's hosted. And I just want to show I, the audience probably cannot read the stages that he's outlined. But like you said, cosmic evolution is not his first stage. His stages actually go particulate evolution, galactic evolution, stellar evolution, planetary, chemical, biological, and then cultural evolution. So those are totally different stages than your stages that you're saying. So I just wanted to make that point clear that this is just one man's uh little baby like his little personal website and his stages disagree with your stages so let me go ahead and respond to that before i continue on with the presentation um it's not just his website um it's on the harvard website and this book is part of one of the classes that he teaches at Harvard. Not to mention, if you've ever opened the book and read it, on the first page, it says the data is backed by NASA patent 01239, whatever the number of the patent is. But the data itself is coming from NASA. This is a professor at Harvard that is teaching this whole theory of big bang to humankind. Now, you're right that his stages aren't the same as my stages. That's because the way that the professor's try and structure this in, in the schools is to try and make it seem smarter than it actually is. Now, yes, I do. I simplify it. So to say the six stages is a simplified version because obviously particulate and galactic that could be considered the big bang all in one section of itself. If you read the book, he's basically separating the big bang into two different forms. Uh, but then you looked at cultural, um, cultural doesn't cultural evolution is a thing. Like we see, society evolved as we progress throughout history but the thing with that is cultural evolution has nothing to do with origins and the creation of the universe that's the problem that creationists and evolutionists have is that we fully disagree on the creation of the universe and how we all got here that's the question we're looking for if you don't have a problem with that then go and tell them to change the wording so that they don't teach this to children and to students in college as it being how the universe got here, because that's the big problem that creationists have is that we don't agree that this universe got here. We have a, we are, we stand firm in our belief that God created the universe. We have our evidence to back it up. And if you don't believe that the big bang is the origin of the universe, then tell them to stop wording it that way. Okay, well, and I've never taken any classes or seen any textbooks where it was worded that way that were from this century. So um, I would just, yeah, I, I don't really have that much else to say other than these. When he says that um, like cultural evolution has nothing to do with the origins of the universe, um, neither does the theory of evolution or abiogenesis or, you know, stellar evolution or any of the other stages he wants to talk about, none of those have to do with the origin of the universe either, but he still wants to lump them in with the theory of evolution. So we can get to the main, um, you know, we, we, we can we can move on to the actual start of the arguments now, if, if, if you'd like, Jamie. Well, um, I'll go to the arguments, but the thing is, all of the stages that I put in the six stages of evolution, they do have to do with the origins of the universe because right now we have humans and we have animals and we have plants, and we have oceans, and we have mountains. Now, creationists say, this got here because God created it. What evolutionists do is they say, no, no, God doesn't exist. It got here because the Big Bang. And then creationists ask them, okay, well, what did the Big Bang do? Well, the Big Bang created all the planets and all the stars, and you know that's where Earth came from. And it's like, okay, well, what did that – so how did humans get here? And then that's how you get the other five stages of evolution. So you can't have humans without the first five stages. That's why me and Kent and just about every other creationist has this 
you know, six stage. Some of them use five stages. It, it really depends on who you're talking to, but that's essentially what these stages are is we're asking you, how did humans get here? Because God says humans got here a certain way and you want to say that God is wrong or that God doesn't exist. So it had to have happened how we say it happened. And then when we ask you how it happened, that's the stages you give us. You give us big bang to this, to that, to that. And the, honestly, I want to get to the abiogenesis. So I would like to roll this presentation on, but yeah. that's what we're arguing about here is that. So just to say, clarify, I'm not making any point about God or gods or whatever. I mean, like all, all of like the big bang and abiogenesis, all that could happen in a, incorporating a theistic worldview. I'm not making any claims about God in this debate. Um, in this sort of line of reasoning, it just reminds me of a quote from Carl Sagan about if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you have to first create the universe. So by your logic with these other stages, I mean, an apple pie recipe should also be an origins topic, because how can you have an apple pie if you don't have the Big Bang? So, you know, that's just a joke. We can move on. Yeah. Well, the apple pie is part of those stages because apples and then whatever makes the bread and so on and so forth. So, yeah, but we'll be here all day if we just keep going back and forth on this one argument. So I guess let's just get into it. All right. I'm going to turn off my little camera right quick so they can see the slides. All right. So, sorry. Okay. So we're going to skip through the Neil deGrasse stuff because me and you both agree that he's probably not the best source. Um, I use that in my video because what he has to say about it is hilarious. So if y'all want to see that, I would recommend go to my channel and watch the video. But first, we're going to start with the conservation of angular momentum. Now, the best way to explain this for those that don't know that much about physics is imagine this grenade right here. We pull the pin and then it blows up, right? Well, when it blows up, we have a way to study and observe and verify that there's going to be certain directions that the pieces fly and they're going to rotate in a specific way. Um, this is a simple diagram that kind of explains it. I know Kent likes to use the uh, seesaw metaphor uh, to explain it, um, but neither here nor there. Scientists have observed this, studied it, tested it, and demonstrated it. So the conservation of angular momentum describes that everything will rotate a specific way based on the explosion. Um, here's the details of that. Uh, well, actually, this is something that is relating to uh, evolution specifically, so I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, the angular momentum would have caused the sun to spin very rapidly, but actually our sun spins very slowly, while the planets move very rapidly around the sun. In fact, although the sun has 99% of the mass of the solar system, it has only 2% of the angular momentum. This pattern is directly opposite to the pattern predicted. This is um, actually coming from the origin of the solar system, which was written um, by Dr. H. Reeves. Um, so again, this is, I don't believe that he's a creationist, so I would have to actually go back and look at that to verify. But the, I think the last time I checked, this is not a creationist that's making this um, statement. So again, we see a problem with the sun as far as conservation of angular momentum is concerned. Um, can I, I know comment when, on, on what you've said so far and this quote in particular? Because I, yeah, I do know Dr. Right. Reeves and he you're right, he's not a he's not a creation scientist. Um, but I think that you're taking this quote a little bit out of context because um, the, the quote has nothing to do with the Big Bang. Right. I mean, this is about the formation of the solar system. Um, and the, this pattern is directly like contrary to the pattern predicted. Um, you kind of are having to fill in by the Big Bang there. And he's not talking about the big bang at all he's talking about the accretion disk theory and, and and the nebular model um so and this was also back in 1978 we've had quite a few advances in our understanding since the late 70s i mean that was before either of us were born um just in uh, i think 2009 or 2013 or 14 we just had um a, an increase in our understanding about like angular momentum in planetary formation so i don't I, I don't know what this has to do with the big bang is my only uh, ob object I, I think that you might be kind of quote mining this a little bit to kind of take okay. it out of the so, original context yeah so i'm not adding the big bang to this what i'm saying here is that they have taken observable science which is the conservation of angular momentum and when people apply that to the solar system because you claim there's a big bang it doesn't match up OK, the Big Bang would have certain physical characteristics to it. He doesn't directly say this is he's talking about the Big Bang. I didn't add it in there with any quotes, 
but this is his observation of the sun. He's saying this doesn't make sense according to the way that the solar system is and the way that we see observable science on Earth. Now, I know you like to make the argument that things work differently in space than they do on Earth, but that is not something that you can do and call science. Uh, okay. when, we were, when we were having our chats uh, before the month before, um, you said something about space doesn't expand the same in, in as it would on Earth, so that's I mean, why conservation. If, if, you, of if I can clarify, count. Um, it because it also addresses what you were talking about with the grenade analogy, and so I just want to point out the difference between an explosion and the Big Bang. So, if, if imagine like kind of like two cubes for this analogy, right? Like ten foot by ten foot cubes. In one, you have a grenade, and the grenade explodes inside the cube. You have an expansion of the volume of the explosion from the grenade. You have um, like conservation of angular momentum at play because you, like you said, the shrapnel all has to be conserving angular momentum, but the size of the cube doesn't change at all. Now in our second cube, imagine that you are doubling the size of this cube. So it's no longer 10 foot by 10 foot. Now it's 20 foot by 20 foot. And all of the distance relationships between everything in the cube is doubled. So two things that were five feet apart are now 10 feet apart. So these are two very, very different scenarios. One is an explosion, the grenade, that's described by classical Newtonian physics. And the other is a expansion. There's no explosion in that cube. You've just expanded all of the distance measurements within that cube. That is what the Big Bang is. It's an expansion of space and time. So it's funny that you say that because it wasn't until the last two decades, if I'm not mistaken, that they changed the term from explosion to expansion. So for a very long time, they taught explosion, and then they realized, oh, if we call it an explosion, then it has to match these laws of physics that we can't explain. And so they changed it to expansion. And even with that, a rapid expansion is still an explosion. I mean, that's just, it, there's no difference in it. Now, if space is expanding, but something is exploding, it should still have the same characteristics. Why would the physical, or why would the laws of physics change in an expanding universe, as you want to call it, as opposed to what we observe today. And then the second question I have in regards to that is, if if you want to say that it's different, well, the question is, how is that science? You can't observe that. Do you have a time machine to go back and watch the universe expand? Because if physics are different in the original expansion of the universe... Right, but if physics are expand, if the physics of a of a galactic expansion or whatever you want to call it, if that's different than what we observe today, it's not. then how do you know it? <laughs> like, how do you no, I'll, how I'll do you know clarify. that that's different? I'll just clarify: it, it, it's not. I'm not saying physics works any differently back then than it does now. We still currently are observing the space time of the universe continue to expand at faster rates, like right now today, and then. Um, you said that there's no difference between the explosion and the, and the expansion, but that's what I was trying to explain with the two cubes. You understand the difference between the two cubes. One cube stayed the same size and the explosion happened within the cube. So the volume of the explosion ex like increased, but in the second example, the actual volume of the cube itself it, 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 it increased. So you see that there is a clear difference between those two concepts, right? I don't see a difference between that because neither here nor there, it's still going to have the same characteristics as an, ex as an explosion, because this is the thing. A, a rapid expansion is what the, is what the new age textbooks call it a rapid expansion. Well, if something is expanding at billions of miles of speed, that is an explosion. Now you're taking it into a different playground. Basically you're taking it, out of our earth that we can observe and putting it into a space, the universe that we can observe. And you're saying, oh, well, because it's in space, you know, it acts differently. It's a, it's a cube expanding. But the thing is, how is that science? How can you prove that? That's what I want. I want you to prove, like, show me where they actually observe this. How did they replicate this? Because part of science is that you have to observe it and you're not observing it. You're hypothesizing it or, or you're assuming in, in other words, uh, observe, steady, or study. You can't study it unless you go back in time. You can't test it unless you were to. I mean, is that what they're doing over there at CERN? Are they creating big bangs and you know observing how the big bang acts? But even then, the big bang would be happening within our Earth gravity system, so the big bang wouldn't be replicatable to the universe. So that's what I'm saying. You're not 
following the steps of scientific theory or scientific method to prove this. This is religion. So the difference is that in a traditional classic explosion, space and time are not changing volume. OK, the explosion is changing volume in the Big Bang and the expansion of space and time. Right. Space and time itself are what are expanding in volume. So their space and time are not bound by the speed of light or properties of matter. Right. Space and time are a metric like a terms of distance measurement and time measurement. These things can expand um, like independently of the matter that is within them right the the space and time is expanding between all the atoms of my body right now like it's just the 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 molecular bonds keep the atoms together and gravity does the same thing within our galaxy but outside of that right we observe this is called hubble's law the more distance that is between us and a, and a star right the more redshift we're going to see the more distance like has expanded so the amount of space between us and a distant object predicts how quickly it's expanding away from us and that would only be the case if it's the actual space and time that is expanding and we know it's space and time because we can also look at distant objects in telescopes and we can see that the actual time is slowed down like we are watching things in a slower motion than they are normally occurring because the actual space and time has expanded um, between us. So Hubble's law, like the relation between the distance and the amount of space and time dilation that we observe is uh, observational evidence of the expansion of space and time right now, like continuing to happen today. So. I haven't heard too much about Hubble's law, so I'll look into that. But from the way you explained it, it seemed like there's a lot of assumptions that go into that. Because what are you observing? You're observing a star, right? You're observing the, the, the stars themselves, right? And when you observe a star, all you're observing is the light from that burning star. So you're making a lot of assumptions based on a burning star. That's all you see is a star's burning. So you can't look at a star and say that star is burning and it's burning slower or faster, or we see a red shift. Therefore the earth, the, the universe is expanding. Like that's a hard thing to prove with, with that's a hard thing to prove off of what you're observing. So again, a lot of built-in assumptions go into that. And that's why we always creationists always make the claim that your yours is just as much a religion as ours because you have to put a lot of faith and a lot of assumptions into it now with with creationists specifically christian creationists we're not assuming anything the bible tells us what we need to what we what our format is essentially and we're just over here taking the verses and trying to back them with science you guys are taking nothing as a foundation and just making it up as you go. That's why the definitions change every two years. That's why the theories change. That's why at one point in time, equ punctuated equilibrium was the main theory. And then they realize, oh, that fails. Let's scrap that. Time and time again, we see that humans are wrong in their interpretations and they have to constantly rewrite it. But when you look back at the debate of creation versus evolutionism, creationists have never had to change their model. In fact, the more science advances, the more it answers our model. The, for example, mitochondrial Eve is a good example. You guys, uh, evolutionists were the ones that came up with mitochondrial Eve, and they made the name because they were mocking Christians. But then when we actually got more into the science of it, and uh, Donnie and Matt uh, do a great job of this, when they actually found out, when they actually studied the mitochondrial Eve from a creationist perspective, it did prove Eve. And so then... Uh, evolutionists had to try and you know backtrack themselves and change the name and i don't know what they try and call it now but they have tried to rename it since then and it hasn't been able to change because it's already stuck so again creationists never have to change their model evolution always is changing its model because it's always being proved wrong and if we get to micro evolution <laughs> in four hours then I'll show you more examples of that. So okay. yeah. In the spirit of what you're saying, like we, we want to get to the later topics. I don't <laughs> think mitochondrial Eve is very on topic and Donnie and I have had discussions on it. So if anyone's curious, they can look at that. But um, I, we, I, I kind of want to get back to the big bang. <laughs> I don't really see it as being yeah. part of like the discussion for tonight. As far as I'm concerned, it's still called mitochondrial Eve. I don't think mitochondrial Eve is evidence to support creation. 
Um, I think it's just protected by math and population genetics, but we can move on. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure you got to respond to everything I said before I went back to the presentation. Um, so my buttons don't really work the way I want them to on my hotkeys. So I have to like constantly go back and forth between the screens manually. Um, but yeah, so conservation of angular momentum. Uh, this is from Cambridge, the ultimate origin of the solar systems. Angular momentum remains obscure. That's from uh, Cambridge University. So again, they just can't explain it. That's from 1992. So I understand 20 years ago, whatever. Um, so I know you're going to discredit that based on age. Oh, 30 um, years ago, your age is showing, Jamie. Oh, yeah, 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I wish I wish I was still uh, 10 years back. But yeah, so yeah, you're right. 30 years, my bad. Um, okay, so here's one of the things about the conservation of angular momentum that I'd like you to answer. Venus and Uranus rotate backwards from the other six planets in our solar system. We have some theories about how the spin of Venus may have been pulled into the sink with the Earth. Unfortunately, they don't really work. Uh, this is coming from David Grispoon, Assistant Professor, Astrophysical and Planetary Sciences. Uh, and this comes directly from his book, again, 97, so almost 30 years. Uh, but these are the kind of things that I want answers to because it doesn't make sense according to the model. Now, even if the universe is expanding, it should still fit within our laws of physics. So if the universe is expanding at the same time that all of these, um, all the matter in the universe is creating everything, well, why is there some things that are rotating a different way than other things? Shouldn't they all be following kind of the same format? And then, you know, uh, I know we talked about cosmic microwave cosmic microwave background radiation, um, but I don't have that in the presentation. But again, why doesn't that show the same pattern? You know, we see the planets rotating in different directions. It doesn't make sense. Not just the planets, but also the moons. And this one right here is kind of the example that I really like to take. Um, eight out of 91 moons rotate backwards. Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune have moons that orbit in both directions. So why is it that one, these three planets have multiple moons that are rotating in different directions within the same orbit? It's because the argument that I hear for Uranus and Earth and Venus is that, oh, well, because they're in different orbits. Well, how do you explain that with the moons? Okay, because the moons, these, let's say that I don't know exactly how many moons Jupiter has, but let's just assume two because there's obviously more than one and they're orbiting in different directions. How do you explain that when they're in the same orbit? Uh, I think that's a good spot to pause. Yeah, I'd like ahead. to respond to some of those points. So the first thing I want to say is that the Big Bang does not, uh, the expansion of space and time does not inherently impart angular momentum on anything in the universe. Um, going back to our example with the two cubes, right? When you have a grenade go off in the first cube, all of the shrapnel has to obey the laws of conservation of angular momentum um, because the explosion is a is a, a classical process the expansion of space and time right the second cube when you've just simply doubled all of the it's like a a metric increase in scale right when you've doubled the distance between everything in the cube and you've doubled all the lengths inside the cube you haven't changed the angular momentum of anything in that cube you haven't imparted any angular momentum on any of those uh, processes so the actual expansion of space and time itself within the big bang context is not responsible for imparting angular momentums on any of the celestial bodies. What you're talking about is more so with the formation of solar systems. So this would be like within the solar nebular uh, hypothesis. Right, so stellar, yeah. So the stellar, yeah, which, so okay. in that case, like you would have, right, these uh, like molecular clouds of like ice and dust, like kind of uh, being pulled together by gravity into these spinning disks. And that's when you can talk about like the concentrate, like the conservation of angular momentum in the formation of the planets and the stars. So within that context, there are a couple explanations that I've come across for um, Uranus and um, like the other, uh, like Venus, like these other bodies, some of the moons that are spinning the other way. So there's a few explanations. The first one is collisions with other objects, right? Like as they're all forming, if you have two objects that are both rotating around in the same direction, right? If, um, if it passes within the orbit on the right side or the left side of a body, it's going to be captured by the gravity, either going one way or the other way. If it hits that 
if the two bodies collide with each other, that's going to change the, the, the relationships of their angular momentums. And that can also reverse the, the spin. It can knock things off of their axis of spin, like with Uranus. This, um, so collisions will affect these things. And then the other big effect um, is with tidal torque. So that's whenever you have this relationship between like um, for like Venus, for instance, with the sun and the other uh, like like Earth and, and the other planetary bodies nearby. Those actually exert a gravitational effect on Venus, which can slow down and like even reverse the, the spin of the, the planet based on like the tidal torque. Um, so there's there's physical uh, naturalistic means by which these angular uh, momentums of these planetary objects can be altered by you know collisions and gravity okay so hold on there because you gave an explanation but again observe study test demonstrate we're stuck at observe we have not observed any of this we have not seen a new moon creation so again you're just trying to come up with an answer based on what your brain can think of. However, you didn't observe it, so you can't call this science. This goes back into the religion category. Now you I'll said- I'll agree that religion. these are, sorry to cut you off. I'll just, I'll yeah. agree that these are hypotheses, right? Like okay, these are correct. like so, physically right, plausible so, explanations, but I agree that they haven't been observed. They're still in the hypothesis stage. Right, and they will always be in the hypothesis stage. So guess what that makes them? Um, a paradox. You'll never be able to answer the question. <laughs> so uh, collision of moons. Now, here's one thing that I find a problem with, with collisions of the moons, all right? Now, if there's a collision, let's say that, you know, I have, you know, this ball in this hand and this ball in this hand, and I throw them into the rotation of the moon, right? And, the, and then the earth somehow throws it off and these two, and these two balls collide with each other. There's going to be some kind of visible damage to both of these balls, especially with the rotation of these speeds. However, we don't see a moon with a piece chipping off of it, okay? They're all perfectly rotated. We don't see fracture points, uh, just like you would see a meteor come down to Earth and smash into the ground. There's a huge crater to answer that question, uh, but you don't see that with these moons. So again, that kind of is a, a major um, road bump in your hypothesis as far as the collision of the moons. Um, Can I now, that real quick? Yeah, go ahead. So like uh, the, the Theia collision hypothesis is, is, a, is a fairly consensus uh, view on the formation of Earth's moon. And so that was when a two like a large like Mars sized body that we call Theia collided with the primordial Earth. And like the collision, the result of this collision was our moon. But the collision, you're right, was was so like, you know, so impactful that it actually liquefied the rock of both of these bodies. So you have this hot molten rock that then recondenses into two spheres by gravity. So, I mean, that's a, that's a good um, chapter in your Bible, I guess. Um, but again, this sounds like something that George Lucas just came up with. And then scientists were like, yeah, we'll adopt that idea. Again, it's a fairy tale. It, you can't prove it. Until you can prove something like that, you can't call it science. And that's the problem that creationists have with evolution is that there's a lot of explanations that you guys come up with, but they're not backed by facts and observations, okay? Now, as far as creation, we don't come up with the theory and we don't publish it, because, in, especially not in your journals because you won't let us publish in your journals, um, but we don't publish it in our journals until it has sound observable evidence to back it up. Again, with the Bible as the foundation, we take the Bible, we say, hey, this is what it says, how does this fit with science? And then we go, we test it, and when we come up with a good answer that follows the, uh, the steps of scientific method, then we post that in our publications because we had to make our own because of the evolution communist system of peer review. Now, you guys will just publish any wild theory that comes out with no kind of observable data, and that's the problem we have is you're telling kids this is a fact. But then when we have these conversations, you say, oh, yeah, that's just a hypothesis. But to a lazy sixth grader or to a lazy eighth grader that doesn't really care, they're just going to accept it as a fact. They're not going to question you on that. And that's the problem we have. OK, so in the interest of time, I want to keep going through the slides. But I will just say, like, these hypotheses, you, uh, you're right, there are hypotheses, but they are based on known physics. Like we I think just this last year, we can we constructed the most um like computationally sophisticated model yet based on like real observable physics like math that we know of um 
about what would happen when the collision of these two kinds of bodies of objects and they they show like the kinds of dynamics that would be at play based on the kinds of physics that we know about today so it's not like they're just completely made up stories like they are based on math and physics um but yeah we we can go ahead and and, and move on because we're still on point one of yeah, i know <laughs> yeah we're gonna be here for a while man so you know i hope you uh, had dinner beforehand um all right so we'll go ahead and move on but these are just the points that i'm making so i want you to i know that i'm not gonna be able to convince you because you're die hard in your belief just as i'm die hard in my belief but i want you to understand why creationists have a problem with your theory all right because i think if we can understand each other on that point then maybe you won't be so avid in trying to dismiss everything we say maybe you'll start considering things we have to say um but neither here nor there let me uh, i really think it's my... a trust issue but what's what what trust issue who are you having the trust problem with because my trust issue is with all of the people that have made theories and then they get proven wrong over and over again yeah i but just as don't far think as on my end, trust on... the scientific community or oh, you know i, I don't accurate. think that there's a trust that the work that they're going on is not you know there's some kind of level of conspiracy or coincidence going on there's not oh there you go yeah that's <laughs> accurate i'll give you a thumbs up for that that's accurate we don't trust you guys because yeah. we've caught you lying multiple times the thing is, why don't you trust us? That's the question. Is it because you just don't want to accept God? Or is it because you've seen us lie over and over again? I mean, I don't trust the things that I don't see demonstrated, like with actual observational like evidence. So if but I see trust that the moon collided to believe you... <laughs> something, then, then I'll, yeah, you... I'll, I'll trust it if it's been, you know, uh, substantiated. But yeah. yeah, you said you don't trust things that aren't observed, but you never observed the planets colliding into each other to make different rotations, but neither here nor there. Um, I'm just saying. <laughs> you, we do observe saying... accretion disks. Okay. All right. So just in the sake of time, let's go ahead and move on. Okay. So here we go. Uh, I'll skip that. That's for my video. Um, so yeah, now we're over to the laws of thermodynamics. Um, just, you know, I'm just going to go over the first law because that's the most obvious one. Um, Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. Now, I know that most evolutionists, they say, well, this is within a closed system. So I can understand that. But according to the Bible, we are the universe itself is within a, a closed system. Because what the Bible says is that beyond the stars, there's another firmament. So according to the evolution model, the entire universe is a closed system of its own. Again, we can't prove that. It's just a theory or a hypothesis, as you want to call it. But if our, according to our model, it's a closed system. So yes, the first law of thermodynamics should count for the entire universe, not just you know within Earth itself. Um, but here's what they have to say in um, your Bibles. Uh, nothing really means nothing. From this state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. Oh, look at that. Uh, explosion, not expansion. Um, this theory of the origin of the universe is called the Big Bang. So there we go. Explosion tied to the Big Bang theory. This was in 89, so almost 40, well, 30, 33, 32, 31 years ago, something like that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so then how does nothing exploding into all the energy in the universe and not not violate the first law of thermodynamics because again matter cannot be created or destroyed so how does nothing create everything now again it says nothing really means nothing so i know that y'all changed the theory since 1989 and you say that all of the matter and all of the energy was in this little infinitesimal dot so i'll give you that i need to update my presentation as far as that goes um, but the real question i have is how did you fit all of everything in the universe into a little bitty dot how did that happen? And then where did that dot come from? That's the biggest question is where did it all come from and how was it all condensed into a dot? Because we can't do that with anything today. There's laws that have to, there's, there's laws of, of, of science that say that these things cannot be condensed down beyond a certain point. So how do you explain all the ocean being condensed down into a dot smaller than the pin, the tip of a pin? Okay. So we've got a big chunk of uh, conversation topics here. So first, I would ask you to go back to that textbook from 1989. 
I think that if you continue reading on that page, you'll see what I'm about to say, basically. The last two sentences are, the Big Bang Theory does not explain how the universe began. The theory only explains how the existing universe could have developed. So the science on that aspect actually has not changed since 1989. The Big Bang Theory still does not offer an explanation for how the universe began, where this energy, you say matter, but you know, it's really energy that we're talking about at that point, like E equals MC squared, like there's an equivalence right, there. But I mean, energy is matter. So yes, again, it's, it's going to take up some high energies that actual matter like atoms could not have formed the energy level would have been too high and too energy dense for any matter to be formed at that at that point. So but that, that is a, the answer to your question about where did it come from? Where did this initial energy come from? Was it just created out of nothing? The Big Bang does not make any claims in that regard. It, they're below like a certain time frame of like 10 to the minus 33 seconds or something like the first like Planck time. The, the Big Bang has no math to describe it. It makes no claims about it. It doesn't describe it at all. It doesn't say okay. where any of this initially came oh, from. So it you said the Big Bang unknown. doesn't say where it began, right? You say the Big Bang doesn't add, doesn't answer where the universe came from, right? But in this specific, like, okay, so here's what I'm saying. They have sentences within the same paragraph that contradict each other because it says right here, however, physicists theorize that from this state of nothingness, the universe began. So, yes, they're trying to use the Big Bang to answer where everything came from and where the universe began. But then two sentences later, oh, but this isn't how it began. But it literally that's literally what they said. They said the physicists theorized that from the state of nothingness, the universe underline began in a gigantic explosion. This is called the Big Bang. And then in the very next sentence, the Big Bang theory doesn't explain how the universe began so you have two contradicting sentences and that completely conflict each other and this is what i'm saying over and over again we can find these contradictions within evolution you won't find those contradictions in the bible but yeah, you'll find them well, all over the science books again i don't really know about this textbook i've never encountered this textbook it looks like a high school textbook but yeah it does seem to contradict itself i would not say that the their first claim about the universe coming from nothing is substantiated within the Big Bang or what we're really talking about is called the Lambda CDM model. That's the the more modern um, like version of this, like the, that encompasses all of our known uh, cosmological science is the Lambda CDM model. But the Big Bang, like I said, uh, even with inflation, it doesn't go back to T equals zero. It doesn't say where all this energy also ultimately originated from. So the only answer that I can, you know, intellectually in an honest <laughs> way convey is that it's unknown. Uh, and mm -hmm. then for your second point here about just saying, how do we get this stuff condensed into such a tiny point? How is that possible? This actually ties in with your earlier question about what they're doing right now at CERN and particle accelerators, because they are actually concentrating this amount of energy into those tiny, tiny sizes. And they are kind of modeling some of this early universe physics before you had, you know, back when, like what they're modeling is where you have such high energy densities that you can't have any atoms form. You can't even have protons form. Like this is so high energy that you, all you have is something called quark gluon plasma, which is sort of the earliest um, physically described thing that we can actually like observe and test at the moment in 2023. Um, in the lab and so we know what kind of dynamics are at play when you have energy that's been compacted that small but what i will say is that at a certain point right you get to such high energies that not even you know that you can't even have particles of matter being formed and so you, particles of matter are called fermions and then particles of energy are called bosons so by E equals MC squared, there's an equivalence between the two. When you get to a certain high enough energy density, you're going to only have boson energy particles. And the key thing is that matter obeys Pauli's exclusion principle and bosons do not, which means that a boson can occupy the exact same space as another boson right on top of, its, of each other. They don't like like two particles of, of atoms, two two electrons or whatever. They cannot occupy the same space. The, like matter, we all know intuitively can't just pass through itself. But a photon or like another kind of boson energy particle can occupy the same space. And you can stack, you know, 
an infinite amount of it right on top of itself. And that is allowed within the currently understood laws of physics. So that's how we're able to condense things so far down. <laughs> because once you have a certain amount of high energy density, all you're going to have are bosonic energy particles. You're not going to have regular matter. So I'm not going to pretend that I know everything that's going on at CERN, but I do follow CERN and I do keep up with some of their stuff. I have to, you know, watch videos to kind of simplify it. Um, but it, the, regardless of that, there's a couple things that I want to point out about CERN. One, that is a highly controlled environment. All right. It is extremely controlled environment. And if even one thing goes wrong in that controlled environment, it creates an explosion, not a rapid expansion, an explosion, a very large explosion. And actually they're saying that if anything were to ever go wrong, it could destroy our universe as we know it. So again, this is a highly controlled environment with severe consequences if things go wrong. Now, when we look at it from that perspective, how did this highly controlled environment happen in a pre-universe, right? So you can stack all these part of, you can stack all these boson particles on top of each other. Although I would have to look into that a little bit more because I'm not fully convinced by that. So I would have to look into that a little bit more. But again, at some point, if that's not controlled, it causes massive damage to the universe. And if there's no universe, then it would probably prevent the universe from happening in the first place. Now, from those to, so from those experiments that they're doing at CERN, remember, it's all very controlled. And if it goes wrong, it causes nothing but chaos. How do we get so much order out of all of that chaos? Because again, this is all controlled. And if you just let it go wild, it will create chaos. It won't create order. It won't create laws. It won't create... Uh, organisms. It won't create uh, beneficial mu beneficial mutation. It won't do anything beneficial left alone. So you see what I'm saying? Like it's a very controlled environment. And this is the same thing with if we ever get to abiogenesis, you know, the claim that, you know, chaos is not going to create order. All right. Molecules have no desire to create life or structure. Molecules are very happy in their own state doing their own thing. They don't, they're, they're, you don't see molecules actively trying to create life or actively trying to create organisms or anything else. They're just there on their own doing their own thing. So we see plenty of problems with this. Okay. So we're getting to a, a lot of points here. So um, I think your, um, your first point was on, um, sorry, can you remind me what your first point was? I think we got to like three different points. Yeah, we got to yeah okay, so I... CERN is a controlled environment. Yes, that's a so, controlled yeah. environment. So you would have this kind of increase in energy density, right? Like the, the reason why it's, it has to be controlled and, and it's so complicated at CERN is because you're, you're you know, it's humans doing this yeah. in a very small experimental space where it's got to be recorded and it's got to be, you know, reliable, repeatable. But if like you have this case right where the if you're kind of running the clock back where right now our universe is expanding so in the past it would be contracting you're going to have less space now because of the conservation of energy you're going to have the same amount of energy but now it's in less space which means the energy density of the universe is increasing so as you get less and less and less space the energy density is going to go up and up and up and up and eventually there's going to be so much energy crammed into such a small amount of space that it's too high energy for matter to even be formed. So it's it's not it doesn't have to be this highly controlled kind of environment. All you need is less space um, because that's just going to condense everything to like and the energy levels are just going to go through the roof. And then um, for your second point, um, sorry, can you remind me what that? Order <laughs> out of chaos. The what? Yeah, the order out of chaos. Yes, order out of chaos, right. So you are correct in that in a closed system, the um, entropy always increases. That's a second law of thermodynamics. So um, in the very early universe, that would be the lowest um, state, like the lowest entropy state in the universe's history. So the very early stages of the universe had the most degree of order. And the amount of disorder and chaos, right, the entropy in like a scientific term, has only gone up since then so right now our state of chaos and disorder you know like you know i'm using those colloquial descriptors for entropy the, the entropy now is higher than it was in the past so the second law is you know is intact there 
And we can talk uh, about the second law in terms of evolution and abiogenesis as well, but I don't know if we want to get all into that at the moment. Yeah, we're going to move into that in a little bit here. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out, though, is, again, the creation model, according to the Bible, says that the entire universe is in a closed system because there's a firmament on the outside. Now, we can't prove that because we haven't reached the end of the universe. But you can't prove that it's an open system because even if it is an open system, you'll never reach the end of it. Correct? Like if it's an open system, there is no ending to it. Well, so, whether or not it's open or closed, the universe is not a three-dimensional object that has like ends or edges. Correct. I don't, it doesn't but really what work. I'm saying, the reason I bring that up though is because what I'm saying is this is where we stop the this is where we stop and draw the line in the sand from science to religion. Because you're going to base all of your theories on your religious view of the universe coming from this dot and exploding and everything else. I'm basing mine off of it's created by God and God says it's a closed system. And now, again, this is a paradox. We'll never be able to answer the question because I don't think we'll ever make it to the end of the universe. But that's what I'm saying. We're basing our foundations on – well, I'm basing my foundation on the Bible. You're basing your foundation on what men have come up with over the 6,000 years we've been here. And that's where I'm saying is like this is where the problem is with creation versus evolution is that I don't think y'all understand that no matter how much science you come up with and no matter how many – well, I won't say science. No matter how many answers you come up with to these questions, until we have a solid foundation proven, that it's all just religion because you you can't prove a lot of the things that you're saying. And I think we haven't even made it out of the Big Bang yet. And multiple times you're saying, oh, that's a hypothesis. Oh, that's a theory of, you know, we think this. This is like, this is like 10, 10 times already that you've said that. So I think the viewers can see that even you are admitting that it's not a fact. And if it's not a fact, then it's not science. We are in the faith-based, we're in the faith-based playground right now. Well, theories and hypotheses are still part of science. Notice the first step in the scientific method is hypothesis. So this is part of the scientific method, right? We come up with theories that make testable novel predictions that are falsifiable. And then we try to falsify them. And that's how we determine like the robustness of a theory. So some of these, like the Big Bang Theory, is quite robust. The Lambda CDM model is, is a very robust theory that describes a whole lot and has a whole lot of verified testable predictions. And then others, like, I know you said we're still in the Big Bang, but we were on solar system formation for a while there. That's a totally <laughs> different realm yep. than the Big Bang. That's the, yep. the solar nebular hypothesis, which it does not have the robustness of the Big Bang model and still has a lot of things that are unknown about it. Uh, the difference, I guess, is what I'm saying is, like, I'm okay to have unknowns, right? It's okay. Like, if we don't have ev enough evidence to say something for certainty, then I'm not going to. I, it's okay to me to not know something. Right. And again, I have no problem with us not having all the answers. But the problem is, is that you're taking not having all the answers and then putting your interpretation on it. That's where the problem comes in. Um, so I guess let's go ahead and continue on so that hopefully we can get somewhere uh, because we have not gotten far at all. Like this is barely the beginning of the presentation. Uh, I don't know how late you plan on saying we might have to take this to the after show, honestly, because it looks like Donnie's already starting to fall asleep over there. No, you guys are doing great. You guys are keeping this entertaining, <laughs> engaging, and I have to Sorry say, uh, very easy to moderate. So uh, it was unpredictable as, as to how the discussion would go, but you guys have been keeping it equally time, focusing on one topic, and just keeping it cordial and intelligent. So let's move on. And uh, since we didn't have any lengthy openings or rebuttals, we can continue the conversation on for... Um, quite a bit more time, you know, there's no rush. And then we'll just wrap it all up with some audience questions. I've already got more than enough audience questions. So I think, you know, if, if people do have questions, I think we're going to have a shorter audience Q and a for this debate, but a longer discussion since you guys have mm -hmm. so much to discuss. I think that's important. So Jamie, move on to the next point and great job, gentlemen. All right. So let me swap right quick. All right. Um, first, turn off my camera. I think we've talked about the Big Bang enough, so I'm just going to actually fast forward us over to the next one. All right. Here we go. 
chemical and stellar evolution. Um, I kind of touched on that just a second ago when I said, um, well, actually, that's really more of an abiogenesis talk. So I'll hold that for a minute. I really want to get to abiogenesis because that's what I've been studying the past month and I've been having a lot of fun with it. Um, <clears throat> but so chemical and stellar evolution. Elements and the Big Bang Theory. This is from sciencelearn.org, uh, New Zealand. Uh, it says, during the formation of the universe some 14 billion years ago in the so-called Big Bang, only the lightest elements were formed, hydrogen and helium, along with trace amounts of lithium and beryllium. But hold on. I thought that everything was in this dot, right? So why is it saying that only hydrogen and helium and lithium and beryllium were made? Where were the rest of the elements inside of this dot? Um, I get it that you said, you know, it's all part of the, um, it, it turns it, it's not, it's not actually matter at this point, but again, hydrogen and helium are not matter either. So neither here nor there. The point I wanted to get to is as the cloud of cosmic dust and gases from the big bang cooled stars formed and then grouped together to form galaxies. Now they say this very dogmatically, but again, they, this is a pure hypothesis. There's no way for them to prove this. They haven't been able to replicate that. <clears throat> but the point is hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium were the first four uh, elements that they agree the Big Bang created. Now, according to this article, during the Big Bang, four main elements were created. It's those four right there. Um, I think I forgot to circle one of them. Oh, well, <clears throat> this is not proven. This is a hypothesis. Uh, next in the process, we need to evolve the rest of the elements in the periodic table. So from those four elements... Oh, I did circle all four of them. Okay. So from those four elements, we have to create all the rest of the elements according to, you know, evolution. <clears throat> this is what they would consider, or this is what we call chemical evolution. Um, he's going to reject that, but neither here nor there. It is what it is. This is an important step in the process. After the Big Bang creates the universe, now we have to have all the chemicals. So here's the um, chart that they've come up with. This is from University of Waikato. This is the uh, theory that they come up with. They say that, you know, stellar nebulas create all this and so on and so forth. Um, evolution says the rest of the elements were formed by stars, um, which would be stellar evolution. So chemical and stellar evolution are kind of the chicken and the egg, which I think I actually have a slide that says that in a little bit here. Um, but essentially, chemical and stellar evolution must happen simultaneously. However, according to these charts, you need iron to form the star. Um, there's a lot of elements there, a lot more than the elements that were there at the Big Bang. So how did these stars form without the elements to create them? This element was not created during the Big Bang. So where does iron come from? Not just iron, but the other elements that are not part of the Big Bang model, the four elements. If you look on that chart, there's a lot more than four elements. Where did those elements come from to create the stars that then created the rest of the chemicals? Again, this is the chicken and the egg problem right? Stellar chemical, which one came first? You have to have one of them. Otherwise the other one doesn't work. So where did all of these elements come from? <clears throat> After we somehow overcome this iron problem, we come across a whole new iron problem. According to these charts, this is the process of a star's growth and what elements it would create. <clears throat> so we go back to the same charts. Um, we have the iron and then it goes and creates all these other forms or Maybe it goes from the outside in. I'm not 100% sure on that. I haven't looked at this presentation in almost three months, so my apologies. <clears throat> but neither here nor there. This is the list of this is the list of chemicals that have to exist to create the star, and for the star to create more chemicals, you have to already have these. But we're missing, or but in the original Big Bang, there was only four of those chemicals made. So this is only nine elements, and none of these elements are higher than iron. There's iron on the periodic table. Um, the important part about that, I did not know that I had to go through all of these. Okay, so here's the points that I want to make off of what I just showed in these slides. One, observation shows us we cannot fuse past iron very well. We're not going to get all of the elements. If you want to make the argument that, yeah, sure, we can, well, then show me how to make gold from iron because I would like to know how to do that. Um, two, this is what chemical and stellar evolution would need to be successful and take us to the next stage. Uh, three, evolution brings no answers for these issues. And four, I think it's safe to say that the idea of evolution falls apart before it even really begins because we haven't even made it past the first three stages and already hundreds of problems. So let's go ahead and see what Grayson has to say on that. 
Sure. Okay. So a lot of points were made there, but first I just want to say hydrogen and helium definitely are matter. I don't know if that was just like a tongue slip or something, but yeah, it was. They are matter. Yeah. Um, and then this is very <laughs> peculiar to me. I don't know why you say that you need to have iron or any of these heavier elements in order to, for stars to form. Uh, you can have stars form with only hydrogen, right? Like usually we have stars formed like with hydrogen and helium and like, you know, s some other composition other than just raw hydrogen, but there's nothing like, there's no reason physically in physics that a, a star would not form with just hydrogen. You do not need iron to, to actually have a star formation. Um, so the reason why the iron is in the center of those charts that you show is because it's the most massive and it, 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 it's because like in the course of a, of a star's lifetime, the, the hydrogen fuses together into helium, the helium fuses together and, and those products fuse together. So as a star gets older and older, its core starts to get more and more iron in it. It doesn't start with iron in the core. Um, so all of these heavier elements are developed through nucleosynthesis over the course of a star's lifetime. You don't need any of these heavier elements in order to actually form the star itself. All you really need is like any kind of molecular, uh, any kind of molecular cloud. Like you could have an entire cloud of just like water particles and they would be able to form a star of like hydrogen and oxygen. Um, that could, uh, if there was enough of it present, there's enough gravity that's pulling these things together, they would undergo enough force and pressure to start nuclear fusion and become a star. So it, the, the starting material doesn't really matter as much for a star's formation. Um, you don't need to have iron or these heavier air elements present for a star to form. Um, and then the last point about where do you get the elements that are heavier than iron? Because it's true that you cannot fuse iron in an energetically advantageous way um, to where this star is going to stay alive. So usually, I think the chart there shows that once the star begins to fuse iron, right? Yeah, in the chart behind your head, yeah, core it only will live yep. for a little longer. Like its yep. time, it, its, its lifespan is severely limited as soon as it starts like, you know, getting down to just the iron because it can't fuse past that in an energetically advantageous way. So the heavier elements are formed in supernovas, right? When, when a star gets to the end of its lifetime and it explodes, the amount of energy density that you can have it, during that explosion is enough to catalyze nuclear fusion of heavier elements. And we can test this with spectroscopy. When we, when we look at the spectral uh, identities of different elements in space, we can look at what uh, are the elements that are making up these stars. We can see like in that chart, you know, we see iron and oxygen and carbon and, and helium and hydrogen. We see all those, but we don't see any of the, the really heavier elements. But then when we point our, you know, spectroscopes at uh, supernova, all of a sudden we can see heavier elements. We can see nickel. OK, we can see heavier elements in supernova explosions, which verifies the theoretical models showing how nuclear fusion can occur within these supernovas as they're exploding. It creates these heavier elements. So this is pretty decently understood. So OK, so uh, the first thing you said was you can make a star with hydrogen and helium. OK, from hydrogen and helium, how do you get carbon? How do you get neon? How do you get Nuclear magnesium? Fusion. Okay. Have they been able to replicate that and test that so that we can see that? Where's the peer reviewed papers that show this nuclear fusion process? And part of these nuclear fusion processes, um, I mean, I would I would recommend that you go watch some of James Tor's stuff because uh, he does a great job of showing how deceptive they are in this because they'll say, oh, well, you know, given this process, you can create you can add, you can create this, this element. But then what you look at in the, in the sub notes is another article that's referring to a test where they add something in there to make it. So again, from hydrogen, I'm not saying you can't make a star from hydrogen and helium. I don't know. I've never made a star, but what I do know is I don't believe that anyone's ever replicated a star. I don't think they've ever sh actually shown the process of how hydrogen and helium will create all of these other creation, all of these other chemicals. So the thing is, if you can make iron from hydrogen and helium, then we wouldn't really have to, you know, go and 
get it out of the earth. We can just create it from water, right? Um, well, it would not be economically advantageous. It, it okay. would cost so much money to make iron from simpler elements that it's so much cheaper to just go and mine it. I mean, it's not even, it would cost millions of dollars. I mean, you have to have a huge particle accelerator or a giant nuclear reactor. Like we have done right. nuclear physics, so, uh, nuclear fusion. It was just in the news a couple of weeks ago. They did it in, in, uh, in, in California, but we, we know like nuclear fusion does occur in stars. We can observe the elements that are being formed in stars. We can see how they change over time and, and which elements are being produced. And, and we can do nuclear fusion in the lab we can do it in particle accelerators. Like we have made uh, elements that are heavier than any elements found in nature. And we've done that in a lab. So we know we have a good idea of these processes. So as, uh, there's two points I want to make to that. The first one is you said we've done it in the lab. Okay. But the thing is inside the lab, again, it's a controlled environment. It's not, a, it's not the nature doing itself. And part of that controlled environment means that in order to make this fusion, you used intelligence. There was an intelligent being making this. So whenever you say we created a star in the lab, I'd say, yeah, and my God created it in the universe. There was an intelligent being that created it, just like your theory. Now you want to say, oh, we made a star in the lab. Therefore, there is no intelligent designer. But you were the intelligent designer in that project. Um, now, the other thing you said was you, you can observe this fusion in the stars, right? And um, that kind of would counteract my statement that I just made about in the lab because you're seeing it in in nature, so to say, right, in space. But the thing is, do you know how they observe a star? They look at it, they calculate the, the, the shades of light, and based on the shades of light that are burning from it, they say, oh, that looks like nickel burning, or oh, that looks like helium burning, or oh, that looks like iron burning. But you're observing something millions of miles away and you're basing an observation off of the color of the burn. So that doesn't really tell you too much. I mean, the only way you could 100% know that they're accurate is if someone flew out there in a spaceship, grabbed a bottle of this star, brought it back and tested it to verify that what they're assuming they're viewing with these, with these burns is accurate. Now I'm not saying that they're hundred percent wrong. I mean, obviously Smart people have put a lot of work into this. So yeah, maybe they are seeing nickel burn. Um, maybe they are seeing hydrogen burn. But this is, again, until they can actually get those chemicals from the star and test it in the lab, it's really a lot of assumptions. Because how do we, what if, just like you said, how space is expanding is different than a grenade exploding on Earth? How do we know that nickel burning in space isn't different than nickel burning on Earth? Well, spectroscopy is the field that you're talking about, measuring the spectral signatures of different um, different elements. Um, and we can actually calculate what the spectral signature for an element or molecule would be based on uh, more elemental physics. So we can start with like quantum physics and we can start about, you know, the kinds of orbitals the electrons are exhibiting. And we can start from the ground up and we can calculate um, what the spectral signatures could be. And then when we look like on earth, right? We can look at these elements. We can look at through spectroscopy of what they look like and they would confirm our predictions. I mean, the field of spectroscopy is, you know, predates even quantum physics. I mean, it's it's been an established field of science for quite a long time. And I, I don't think that anybody, even within the creationism sphere is questioning the, valid val the validity of spectroscopy. Um, so I'm not questioning the validity. I want to clarify that. I'm not questioning the validity. I'm questioning the accuracy. That's my question is because, we, like you said, we take it from the ground up, right? But earlier when we were talking about the Big Bang, you said things work differently in space than they do on Earth because of expansions. and so. Well, if things work differently in space based on what you said on the Big Bang theory, well, then how do we know that when nickel's burning in space, it's not a different color. Or, you know, how do we know how, like, again, we don't know how accurate these hypotheses and these assumptions are. Now, you said it's an established science. Well, yeah, I'm not saying that they haven't been studying this for a long time and they come up with some pretty good theories based on it. But again, it's just like radiometric dating. There's a lot of built in assumptions that go into it. And until we can answer those assumptions with solid, verifiable facts, it's really a loosely based theory okay i just want to clarify something i did not say that 
anything is working differently in space uh, at the beginning. I, I just want to make that clear, like the, the laws of physics, uh, if you want to call it an assumption to say that the laws of physics work the same all over the universe. Um, sure. Like that, that can be your assumption. I, it's a, I, it's an assumption that I'm willing to make. I think that it's very fair. Now, if the laws of physics work somehow differently over in a different galaxy and somehow the spectral signature of nickel is different because the laws of physics are different, then sure. I mean, it, that that's something that could happen. I don't really see evidence to think that. I think that we see like these kind of spectral signatures and uh, be very consistent everywhere in the universe where we look for them. But sure. I mean, if you if you want to say it's just an assumption that I'm making that the laws of physics are the same everywhere. Sure. I'll grant you that that's an assumption I'm making. Well, right? no, I mean, you're you're changing my words now because that's not what I said. I said that according to what you're saying, the laws of physics can change in space. That, that's essentially no, what you're saying not, with no, the Big no. Bang Theory because you're saying an explosion in space is not really an explosion on, like an explosion on Earth. And No, no, no. no now you're twisting <laughs> my words. Well, that's basically what you said. I mean, no, no, you, like a supernova is an though. explosion in space, right? I'm agreeing that explosions can happen in space. I'm, I'm just saying that the Big Bang is, is not an explosion like those other kinds of explosions. Like there's there's nothing that's well, like, see, you're saying you that the Big Bang is not an explosion. Hold on. Like I'm, I'm willing to bet that this is actually the, a, a similar case for both you and most of the audience. Like when you think of the Big Bang, most people think of a tiny, like small dot of light that all of a sudden gets really big. But that doesn't make any sense as a way of thinking about it, because where would you be watching this from? right? Like you would have to be outside of the universe if you're seeing it as a tiny little dot expanding. No, like the Big Bang occurred at every single point in the universe. Like everywhere within the universe was the center of this Big Bang. It was not an explosion that started from one little point and then went out all over. Like it's not expanding into anything like an explosion is expanding into the space around it. There was no space around it. Every single point in space was getting farther away from every other point in space. There's no center. It, it, it The analogy to an explosion just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I didn't have time to write down my thought before I lost it. I had a okay, thought well, on that. I mean, um, if you want, so. I mean, we're, we're almost to abiogenesis, right? We're almost <laughs> Yeah, we're there. so close. Yeah, we're so close. Um, but, oh, so the point I was making, though, is that you – evolution theory and the scientists that believe in evolution are constantly changing to to match whatever their new hypothesis is but the thing is it's kind of like anything goes kind of it's like anything goes practice you know if this doesn't work this year and you know creationists debunk that the next year you'll come up with a new answer and it'll be completely off the walls and we have to go through all this work of debunking that before you give it up and give go to the next made up answer but that's the thing i'm saying is that that these are where the assumptions come in because you're saying it's not based on assumptions it's based on hypotheses and theories and that theories are science well if theories are science then so is creation creation is science because it's a theory but a we're theory. not gonna oh it's a theory end of story but anyway in a colloquial uh, sense it's a theory but not in okay. a scientific sense but oh, because I, let's it's not get bogged down on model, that. it's not science see that's let's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying it, with evolution anything goes as long as it fits what you want it to conclude. And that is not science. That's deceptive. Okay. Yeah, that's not uh, what's happening here. That's exactly what's happening because earlier on you said anything, if it's a theory, it's science, right? Because I said it's it's not you. No, earlier, I said I can't theories are part about. of science. Like theories are no, you said theories are science. hypotheses. But see, that's what I'm saying though, is you guys will come up with the craziest ideas and then we debunk them. And then you say, okay, well, it's not a part of science anymore, but it was never a part of science. And then you come up with another crazy idea well, the, and say, oh, well, that's part of the science whole now. scientific method is proposing hypotheses, checking them against evidence, and then falsifying them or reifying them. If they get reified by observational evidence, then they become theories. If they get falsified, then they're thrown aside. So then how is creation not a part of science? Because it's a theory. Because it's been falsified. It has not been falsified. The okay. way you falsify it, here's how evolutionists falsify creation. Oh, it involves God. It's falsified. That's how no. you falsify it. That's no, exactly the Big how you Bang can it. involve God. The, the, there's nothing in the Big Bang that says that God doesn't exist. Like that, You can okay, totally so then, believe in God and the Big Bang. So just like that uh, page from the science book we looked at earlier, you just said two contradicting sentences. You said, oh, it... it 
it, God can't exist inside of science, but it has to fit our theistic evolution. But then just say uh, two sentences earlier, you said, oh, no, creation is not a part of science. But theistic evolution, which would be a form of creation, is a part of science. So which is it? Is it part of science okay, or if not? If you want to say theistic evolution <laughs> is a form of creation, then I'll amend my previous statement. I was referring to creationism as in like Noah's flood and the Adam and Eve story. That stuff is falsifiable. And it has been falsified it's not as falsifiable. far as I'm concerned. There's solid evidence to prove those, and we'll do another debate yeah, on that. Yeah, that would be outside topic. of the scope of the current yeah. topic of we'll do a whole other debate on that specific topic yeah. because it is very it's very easy to prove these these theories. Okay. Uh, well, now do you want to move on let's to go ahead analysis? and yeah, let's go ahead and move back on to the uh, chemical stellar question. Um, again, even if you know, let's just I'll give you this hydrogen and helium. We put it together and we make half of the chemicals in the universe. But yet we only, as far as they've recorded, the farthest we've gotten is, you said nickel, I believe. Where does gold come into play? Supernovas. Where does platinum come into play? Supernovas. Okay, but how, how can you prove that, though? That's just a that's We just can a look at supernovas and we can see that there are heavier elements than just iron in supernovas. So we can measure their abundances in supernovas and see this. And there are also some other more exotic processes, like in neutron stars and you know, other kinds of like proton captures that can happen, but the majority is coming from supernovas. Okay. But here's the thing you're observe when you observe a supernova, what you are observing is a star exploding, yes. right? How do you know that the star that exploded didn't already have that in it? Because we don't observe stars that have these chemicals in them. Like you if just we said found that the, stars the explosion that have of the star has it. Them, huh? That's what I'm saying. You haven't observed every single star in the universe. You're but every star that we've observed up. only has like what you're showing on the screen. It, it, it goes up to iron. You, you don't find these like heavier elements in stars until when you observe them going supernova and then you see them. So you're seeing their, their creation when you observe supernovas. See, and that to me, that sounds like a, that sounds like a lot of assumptions. So I guess we'll kind of leave that at that point. Well, if you can find a star that has those heavier elements in them already. Okay, so again, like I said, that's a lot of assumptions because you're saying, oh, we see it when it explodes, but you know, we didn't see it beforehand, even though you know we didn't really pay attention to that star until after it exploded. And there's only trillions of stars per person, so yeah, we've observed all of them, and you know, none of them have this in it. It, it just there's a lot of assumptions and a lot of ignored possibilities when you're looking at, oh, these supernovas now have new things in them. It's that might not be the case. It might have already been there. Again. I'm not a physicist and I don't study that specifically, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions that come up that I don't believe they've ever addressed. Well, you said you've been <laughs> studying a lot of abiogenesis recently. So hope let, let's, let's, yeah. you know, that's what's that right after. Here we go. Uh, yeah, here we go. Okay, that's what I thought was coming up abiogenesis. next. Abiogenesis. Yes. So this is the one that I've been having fun with. I didn't have time to add the slides on here from uh, what I've been learning through uh, different professors. Uh, but I just, I kind of wanted to keep it in the same PowerPoint presentation as the video because that's what we agreed on was to debate the topic of the video. So I wanted to have just the same presentation and then, you know, all the new stuff that I've learned will add throughout the conversation. Okay, so organic evolution. Organic evolution is the most important stage of evolution as it is supposed to answer the question of the origin of life. The idea is that life formed from non-living material. This has never been observed, tested, or replicated. In fact, as of today, all experiments have failed miserably and no one in the scientific community can even agree on a theory on how this could happen. There's plenty of synthetic chemists out there that fail miserably at doing this. Uh, there's some experiments where they say, oh, we created a couple of proteins here, but then when you go and look at the sourced notes and you look at the other references they make, they added things that were already purified chemicals from their lab that they purchased from somewhere else. So we don't actually see them creating anything in the lab. And even if they did create something, whoops, even if they did create something, it would require intelligence. So that's the thing. Um, I, for anyone that isn't very well versed in abiogenesis, I would highly recommend you start with James Tour because uh, he does a great job of explaining this. Even though it's a little complicated, you have to look up terminologies and kind of do a little bit of a little bit of extra study to what he's saying. But 
what I've noticed is in all of those peer-reviewed papers, they'll say, we started with these one chemical compounds. And then throughout the peer-reviewed paper, they say we did all of these processes and we created this new chemical compound that would be one of the proteins we use for life. But then when you look at the reference notes, they reference other studies where they added these purified chemicals into the mix. So what they're doing is they're not actually starting with nothing. They're starting with an ingredient and then adding to that ingredient. And then therefore they're not actually creating anything. They're just adding and mixing. And you know, then they say, Oh, we got this one D glucose sugar, but they never really got the D glucose sugar from what we would see in a prebiotic world. They got it from adding it from what was in their cabinet in the lab. So that's the big thing I have with abiogenesis. And then the other thing I wanted to point out about abiogenesis was first, uh, all this, all the scientific tests that have been done on abiogenesis, uh, it all required intelligence. It's always someone trying to manipulate the chemistry. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out about that is in the natural world, we don't see that ever happening. Okay. Molecules never show an, a, um, a desire to want to create anything other than the molecule that they already are. So that's what I'm saying is they're really stepping out of the box and trying to add a lot of, you know, imagination to abiogenesis. So I want to see what you have to say, and I'll kind of just bounce off of you from there. Yeah, so I kind of want to get a little bit of clarification from you about like sort of what claims you're making in regards to abiogenesis, because I'll be the first one to agree that we don't have like a consensus hypothesis, like abiogenesis is a big unknown, like we know that it happened, like in both of our models, abiogenesis happened, whether it's directed by a god or not. We know that at some point there was no life in the universe. And then at another point, life had to have come from non-life. The mechanism for how that happened is what's unknown. But I think mm -hmm. both of us agreed that at some point that happened. Um, so, so what I would, you know, what I would recommend for, for a reference. Second, what I want to okay. ask is, are you trying to say that like, abiogenesis is impossible without a god or like what is the kind of claim that is being made um so there's two claims side. that i'm making uh the first claim is we would never see it in nature so therefore it seems like it would be impossible to for this theory to even come about like we know that life is here we know it had to have happened but that's about all we know and you agree on that we can both agree on that however we don't see any mechanism that shows this happening. So it appears that abiogenesis is impossible without intelligent design. That's the main statement I'm making. The okay. second statement I'm making is that as far as what synthetic chemists have tried to use to prove it up to this point has been extremely deceptive because. Um, okay, wait, before we get to the second point, um, if, if I can, if, if you can remember yeah, what ahead. the second point is. And yeah, we can let me just go ahead and write it down. Okay, so in terms of the first point, right, I think that it's important to acknowledge like about why we don't see uh, like life coming from non-life today, right? There are things about the earth that are different today than they were in the past, okay? So the biggest difference is that life is already present, okay? And life eats organic molecules. Mm -hmm. So if anything started to being formed, if any of these chemicals started to come together, I mean, they're going to get eaten pretty fast by like a bacteria or whatever is the life that's already there. So the life that's present already gets in the way of a lot of these processes. Like when these processes occurred for the first time, there was no other forms of life that were competing for resources. So the life that we have today is much more efficient and is is much you know uh, better at at its ecological niches than any of these would have been. So they simply would get out of the today. And the second big difference um, would be obviously like there's going to be like temperature differences and weather differences, things like that. But the biggest difference is the presence of oxygen. So we know that based on the types of rocks that formed in the very like early layers that oxygen was not present in any appreciable amount in the early earth atmosphere. So oxygen is kind of like a toxin to a lot of, of, of this chemistry that's going on and it doesn't occur in the presence of oxygen. So because we have a lot of oxygen today and because we have a lot of other kinds of life already today, um, that is a, a huge reason why we don't observe this process happening today on earth. So a lot of points you made that I want to touch on. Um, 
First is you said oxygen is toxic to a lot of the processes that would be needed. Uh, the best example would be the Miller-Urey experiment. The only way they could get anything was with the lack of oxygen. And I would agree with you that that is true. Um, however, it doesn't make sense when we look at what we observe today and trying to go backwards in time like you want to do. Uh, the reason for that is because as we go back in time, there was a point where there was extremely high concentration of oxygen. So according to what your model would be saying, even though you don't really, even though y'all don't really have a model, but you know, the ideas that y'all are coming up with so far is saying that the beginning, no oxygen. And then out of nowhere, we get a whole bunch of oxygen. And then now we're losing that oxygen. So it just Not doesn't make sense. It's, it's just this like huge roller coaster of like, oh, no oxygen. Once everything's created, then we have oxygen. But the bigger problem with that is in order to create life, just about every single piece of life requires oxygen to live. So even if you created life, and I know you're going to try and go to the, um, uh, I forgot the term, but it's a bacteria that doesn't require life to live. But the thing with that is that bacteria then has to create something else that does require life. So that you either have a universe of no oxygen, or you either have a, a planet of no oxygen and this bacteria and that's where it stops or else you have to figure out how oxygen comes into play. And that's a huge obstacle for abiogenesis. Um, so I can address there's, that there's, quick. yeah, so there's, de there's theories that go back and forth on the whole oxygen. There's some theories that come up with the idea that, Oh, the, the universe came or the, the life came from a water environment. Professor Dan likes to use, or he's not really a professor, but you know, uh, Dan or Dave or whatever is professor Dave. That's his name. Professor Dave. He likes to talk about the um, the water earth or the water world idea that, you know, oh, the, it was all water and then that's inside of the water is where life was created. But then when we see other experiments like the Miller-Urey and the 60 versions of that that have happened over the generations, they say there's no possible way that oxygen would be present because it would destroy everything in the process. And I mean, that's observable. We observe that when they try to do that oxygen destroys it. So we know that there's no way that it's possible, but again, it's a seesaw. It's like whatever fits the theory that, you know, you can put into the books without us debunking immediately. That's what goes. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about how everything is kind of a, anything goes as long as it supports evolution. And then once it gets debunked, we'll come up with something new to waste your time when really we're not progressing science. We're constantly going back and forth on this seesaw that's preventing us from furthering our intelligence. Okay, so there are a couple of reasons that we know that oxygen was not present in the early Earth. The, the kinds of rocks that are formed, right? There's a difference between the rocks that form now and the rocks that were forming then. And that difference is the presence of oxygen. The rocks that form today are you get you got forms of oxides like rust, for example, is iron oxide. It only forms in the presence of oxygen because oxygen is an oxidizing agent. And, and like the oxidation process is like, you know, is damaging to all kinds of different molecules. That's why oxygen is a toxin. There are lots of organisms that do not exist. Uh, like they don't have oxygen metabolism. Um, they're, they're like you said, types of bacteria. And the uh, whenever they do a calculation for the LUCA, the last universal common ancestor, they look at what thing, like what proteins and systems are shared between all forms of living life today. That, uh, that LUCA organism is an anoxic organism. It's an organism that doesn't have any oxygen metabolism. It doesn't interact with oxygen in those ways. It lives in, in environments without oxygen. And we see, um, you know, once you get rock layers of a certain age, then that you stop seeing any oxides present. You stop seeing any evidence for any oxygen in the, in the, in the formation of these rocks. And then for the reason for where the oxygen came from in the atmosphere today, um, as soon as you have uh, photosynthesis occurring, like with cyanobacteria, once they evolve photosynthesis, that the byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. And you can actually see this um, kind of corresponds with, a, with layers in the, in the geologic column of like magnesium oxide um, or maybe manganese oxide. I don't recall at the moment, but you can literally see the chemical signatures right around the time um, when we think that photosynthesis evolved, you can see the amount of oxygen just go up tremendously. You can see in this kind of chemical compositions of the rock layers. Um, and at that time, right, nothing had evolved to metabolize oxygen. So it was a huge extinction event. 
I mean, lots of the microbial life that had evolved previously in, a, in an environment that didn't have oxygen died out. And this cyanobacteria that was emitting all of this oxygen, right? It's kind of like, you know, the first climate change crisis from an air pollutant. Like it's all this oxygen being released that's killing off so much life. There was a huge extinction event to which life adapted and evolved and was able to develop these oxygen processing systems. All right. So a couple of things you said there. Um, first, you said, oh, well, we look back at Luca, the last universal common ancestor and make all these assumptions. Uh, but the thing is, we don't know what Luca was. This is an assumption that you're making based on your, you know, your tree of life, which is, again, made up. Um, the second thing is you said creatures in the beginning couldn't metabolize oxygen. Well, if the creatures in the beginning were the ana aerobic is that the one can't breathe oxygen bacteria the anaerobic bacteria um i believe that oxygen kills them so as they're trying to create the next form that's going to create oxygen they're going to be destroyed so again that's what i'm saying if you have a oxygen free environment that's creating this the first life the abiogenesis as soon as oxygen gets introduced it destroys the life and you're back at square one so it's a seesaw um the next thing it was a big it was a huge extinction event i'm agreeing with you but like right but the extinction event in that extinction event nothing would have survived because everything would have been destroyed by oxygen so what you're saying is that as soon as the oxygen came into the light as soon as the oxygen came into play they immediately evolved which goes completely against your theory of evolution well, because you don't believe in equal punctuated equilibrium that well, oxygen just doesn't hit. just all of a sudden go from nothing to like everywhere, right? It, it increases over time as the oxygen output is increasing, just like we observed today with greenhouse gases. It's not all of a sudden zero to 100. It's like it, it ramps up over time. So you're going to have varieties and it's a new adaptive pressure, right? So you're going to have varieties of organisms that like have different propensities of being able to tolerate these oxygen levels. And you're going to have some places that have higher oxygen levels than other places. So the, you're going to have these varieties. You're going to have natural selection that's going to, you know, be directing a like the abilities of these organisms to be able to tolerate oxygen levels. So the, the, the best way I can uh, analogize this to kind of uh, help the people understand what you're saying here is because the oxygen is going to destroy these these organisms, these non-oxygen breathing organisms will be destroyed by oxygen. So that would be, and you're saying that, you know, over time they would adapt to be able to breathe. They would adapt to be able to survive in oxygen. But here's the thing. Let's say that we go out to the ocean and I'm going to dunk you underwater, not all the way to the bottom of the ocean, just, just, just two feet underwater. Now evolve the ability to breathe water. That's essentially what we're up against is you're already underwater and dying. So you either have to immediately evolve that ability or you're going to die before you can evolve that ability. So either you are going to now accept the idea of punctuated equilibrium, which everyone in the scientific community disregards at, as of now, uh, a couple decade ago, they might've disagreed on that. But this is the problem we have is that you're now going back and forth on this seesaw of, oh, this was disproven, but we're going to agree with this now. And it goes back to what I was saying that with evolution, it's not a scientific structure. It's just anything goes as long as it answers the question at hand. If we get to the, if we're, as long as we're not addressing the other questions in the background, we can accept it as science. But as soon as we address the other questions in the background, we're going to, we're going to disregard that and come up with a new answer. And it's just that anything goes to deceive the people. Um, now there was a couple things I didn't get to go to before you had your response. Um, you said that prebiotic life didn't compete again. We don't know that. And according to what we see in the world today, they still would have been competing for resources. They would have been competing for whatever it is that anaerobic bacteria don't breathe or whatever anaerobic bacteria use to stay alive. So they would be competing for something. We just don't know what it would be. Um, then you said, uh, oh yeah, you said that we can't actually test abiogenesis because of the world that we're in today. We're in a world that's constantly, you know, creating carbon and eating carbon and so on and so forth. So we can't actually test abiogenesis. Well, if we can't test it, it can't be proved. It's not science. It's a paradox. Um, the next thing that I wrote down was... I, I think you're kind of warping my words. I didn't say we couldn't test it. I just said that that's why we don't observe abiogenesis today. And I do agree that these early self-replicating systems would be competing with each other for resources. I'm saying that they're not competing with 
presently existing organisms that are much better and more efficient. So they're not, like anything that was, you know, any chemical system that came about today that, you know, in a vacuum without any other living organisms around it could potentially like go down the abiogenesis route just is going to get eaten. Like there's other living organisms already present today that would not have been the case back during abiogenesis. So it's still competing with like the other like, you know, uh, the chemical systems at that time, but it's not competing with like a fully fledged bacteria or something that we would, that it would be competing with today. Right. But again, we don't know what it was competing with. We don't know how it survived without oxygen, even though, you know, anaerobic bacteria wouldn't need oxygen. We don't know how it would have survived once oxygen got introduced. Um, and again, this, there's just a lot of, we don't knows. Um, one thing I wanted to point out though, is because a lot of synthetic chemists specifically try and test different ways to create the proteins for life. So because there's a lot of unknowns for the mechanism, they've decided, well, let's just try and create the ingredients, right? So that's what they're doing in the lab right now. They're trying to create the ingredients for this. Now there was one example I wanted to use, but before I get to that, I just need to make this point. Um, now when they test abiogenesis, they take a couple of molecules that they hypothesize were the first molecules that were used for life. And they say, well, we have to create, um, I'm not really good with the names, but there's certain proteins that have to be made in order to create life. So they'll take two of these proteins and try and make four of the proteins. And so when they do that, they say in the papers, we did this process and we came up with four proteins from the beginning too. But really, they lost a lot of the two proteins to get the four proteins. And then when you read the references, they're actually adding chemicals that are purified bases from their laboratory to create the extra two. So they're adding chemicals that technically wouldn't have existed in the prebiotic world to create this new life. And again, this requires a lot of intelligence to do this. Now, the main the main the main um, study that I really remembered off the top of my head uh, because it just absolutely blew my mind was D glucose. There's a certain protein uh, for life that has to be made, and it's a it's a way that six D glucoses connect to each other to form this one protein. However, what's really interesting about this D glucose is that out of the six D glucoses that have to form with each other, there is over a trillion different ways that it could connect and it can only connect one way to make this protein. If it connects any other way, this one protein will never be made. So this is one ingredient, okay, with a 90, 999 billion chance of failure and somehow it just accidentally happened and, and then that's one ingredient and that we have to look at this for like the 20, I think it's, I think it's 20 or 22 or something like that. Okay. Proteins I gotta that jump in on this, Jamie, because like, so I just, there's so many things I just, and this, I don't want to be nitpicky, but some things just have to be clarified. Glucose is not a protein. It's a carbohydrate. The, the six things that you're talking about coming together are the carbon atoms that come together to form the glucose ring, and they can be in all kinds of different conformations. Okay, There's so maybe that's why I'm getting it mixed up then. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so you're asking specifically about the formation of these building blocks of life, Yes, right? yes, so, okay. So again, I'm, I'm still new to chemistry. Yeah. So yes, my terminology may be a little off. I know, still, I, I, I didn't want to like nitpick you on that stuff, but yeah, it yeah, you're right, though. bothered you're right, me a though. little bit. Yeah, I want you to correct me on that because I'm still learning chemistry, yeah. and as I'm learning, there it, it gets very complicating but yes the oh, building blocks we're looking so at this for, building block so the there's two paths that i want to go down with this the first of all is that a lot of these things can be built using scaffolding right so there's types of scaffolds that ensure that whenever the the formation of if you want to say glucose or we can talk about like nucleosides like for dna um, which also have these kind of like chirality and these different conformational varieties if when you have a scaffold right? A template that is like formed of like proteins, right? Then every time that these are formed, they're going to be formed in the same conformation. Okay, right? but hold not, on a you're second. no longer rolling you, dice because you have a scaffold. But see, you can't have the scaffold because that implies that yes. someone put it there. So that's why I wanted to say that there, there were two things I wanted to go with this. The first was talking about the scaffolding, which would address these kinds of conformations. That says there's a designer. That a would scaffold, suggest a designer. So you have to yes. talk about the formation of the scaffold. So 
when we talk about these four, uh, these building blocks that you need, right? Like the, the biggest thing that you would need for the scaffold, right? The scaffold is going to be protein. That means it's going to be made of amino acids. So you need the amino acids. And luckily, you know, we see amino acids being formed naturally, right? There's, there's two lines of evidence for this. The first is meteorites. Like we see meteorites fall to earth today. When we go and look at them, they're full of amino acids, like full of them. Like these things are forming like up in space from natural processes. And they can also form in deep sea vents, like down in the earth. You can have like some complex organic molecules being formed in deep sea vents. But a lot of this was already formed like in the ice and dust that came together in the accretion disk for the solar system. It already contained amino acids and all kinds of complicated organic molecules. And um, there is a, a paper I read recently talking about the mechanism for how complex organic molecules can form in space, right? Like you have these molecular clouds of, you know, carbon and, and various molecules. They're getting bathed in ultraviolet radiation because they're not getting protected by any kind of magnetic, uh, you know, uh, sphere or anything, magnetic field. So that you see and we can right now we can also look at spectroscopy in space we can see that most of the carbon that we see in space or maybe 20 percent of all the carbon is forming these complex organic molecules a lot of them are amino acids which again we find in abundant amounts in meteorites up in space so we do find amino acids those are the 20 things that need to come together to form the proteins we find those building blocks naturally occurring they're produced by natural means. And then the interesting thing. Uh, okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a second, though, because you said we find those amino acids today. But according to your, according to a biogenesis, they would not have existed until after life was already there. Unless no, you no, want to no, go no. with, because what you're doing is you're saying, oh, well, it, it came from space and we saw it created in the stars. Well, one, you can't, you can't prove that. You can't say, oh, yeah, we, we got this meteorite and it has amino acids in it because guess what? The meteorite that you're testing is in today's world where amino acids already exist. So there's a huge problem there. When you add space into the equation, you now have a bigger mystery to try and figure out because now you're not limited to abiogenesis happening on Earth. Now you got to figure out how, how the amino acids were created in space because yeah. there's your bigger problem. Now, the other thing you said was they could also come from the sea vents. However, we just talked about how water would have destroyed life before life was created. So sea vents, not an option. Your only option is to expand the problem to space, which only makes it harder to prove. Right. So sea vents, still an option because there are hydrophobic pockets. Okay. So you have like uh, materials like lipids, right? And you said earlier that these chemicals do not naturally form into anything other than like the you know, their, their chemical structure, but that's not true with things like lipids and amino acids. So lipids um, are a kind of molecule that will come together and other kinds of molecules do this as well. It doesn't necessarily just have to be lipids. It's just any kind of molecule that has one end that's attracted to water and one end that's repelled by water. And just a molecule that's shaped in that way will naturally form bubbles, right? The, the ends that attract water on the outside, the ends that repel water on the inside. Um, and so you can have these hydrophobic bubbles. They're formed naturally. You can just introduce the chemicals into water. They'll form these without any direction or design, right? Like um, these things occur spontaneously. They form hydrophobic pockets that are associated with other hydrophobic uh, chemicals, like some amino acids. But I want to make the point um, that. Um, so hold on. The thing that just wait, confusing wait, one, me one is thing, that you did say something I want to address real quick. Is that you said that these building blocks don't occur until after life, which is not true. I'm saying these complex organic molecules, these amino acids, were already present at the formation of the solar system, like before the sun even started fusing, uh, like hydrogen. These amino acids were already present in the stardust of the accretion disk, so they predate even the formation of planets. So see, that is a major assumption, okay? <laughs> because again, to have these amino acids, you now have to have all these chemicals that didn't exist yet. So again, that's a huge, that's a huge circular argument. It's like, oh, we didn't have these, we didn't have all the chemicals in the periodic table, but we had enough to make the amino acids to make life. So again, I don't think, I don't think that's a valid argument for you to make. Uh, the second thing is you kept going back to the sea vents, but we clarified multiple times previously that in the pre in the 
pre in the uh, prebiotic world, there was no oxygen. If there's no oxygen, how is there water? Water also destroys, or water also destroys. It's there's not still just water. oxygen. Yeah, the oxygen there's is not, not the only thing that sorry, destroys. There's, there's not molecular oxygen in the atmosphere. There's still oxygen present in the water. It's just not in the okay. O2 form in the air. Right. So here's the thing. Oxygen destroys. They have verified that with the Miller-Urey experiments. They've also verified that water destroys. For example, um, when a – let's say that you were to murder somebody and you threw them in the river. Their – DNA is going to deteriorate much faster and worse in the water, and it makes it a lot harder for the police to be able to get information from that dead body because the water is destroying the, the, the material of the human. So it's the same thing with a prebiotic world that's trying to build the human in the first place. Then you said that it would create it would it would it would the life would make itself from the sea vents in these bubbles. Well, what is a bubble? A bubble is oxygen inside of the water. So explain to me what kind of bubble you're looking at here, because if you have a bubble in the water, usually that bubble is oxygen inside of the water. And then once it gets to the top, the oxygen goes out into the atmosphere. So do you have oxygen or don't you have oxygen? What yeah, kind of bubble is an, this? An anoxic environment in the in interior of the bubble. These are not bubbles of air. Okay. So what is the bubble of? Because in order for it to be a bubble in water, it cannot be water. You can't yeah, have so a we can, water we can bubble inside of water. observe this right now today. You, you take a lipid, you put it in some water, you look at what's inside, right? It, it's going to be anything that was like the water is forced out, right? All of that, like during the formation of the lipid, right? You're not going to have anything on the interior or you're going to have a lipid bilayer to where you have the water attracting side, the water repelling side, and then another layer of water repelling and then water attracting. So in that case, right, the the two sides of the lipid that are water repelling are going to be end to end. And you can have any kind of hydrophilic molecule within that space in the membrane of the bubble. So that is the kind of formation that we have in our cells right now. And we have a lot of proteins and kind of chemistry that only exists within that hydrophilic or hydrophobic area where there's no water in between the lay in the layer the membrane layer of these bubbles yeah but the thing is like you're trying to make it sound like this is totally easy to just happen by chance and it's not because these are extremely yes. complex chemical structures when you look at these chemical structures they're extremely complex and there's trillions of ways that they could but how do you can you prove that though yes how do you Okay, how can you prove it in a prebiotic world? That's the if question. If you put a lot because of lipids in a container, they will spontaneously form these lipid bilayers. Like, right, but you have to have lipids to do that. Yeah, it's just That's the chemical saying. properties of the molecule that dictate the kind of structures that they, that they form. And with the protein equivalent would be amyloids. So proteins will like clump. And this happens with like, as you get older, just the proteins that are existing in your body will clump together and form amyloids. It's like a plaque in your, in your brain. Um, like the, these, they naturally will form from like any kind of proteins. It does, you don't need a specific sequence. You don't need specific types. Like most kind of amino acids will form amyloids. Like it'll clump together like that. But see, the, here's the problem though. You already have the proteins. You already have the lipids. Abiogenesis is trying to explain how all of this came about to make life in the first place. And your only answer is they were already made in the stars and they somehow came to earth. Well, I just explained how these happening. building blocks are, are observed like naturally occurring. Like we we know amino acids. But that's acids the thing. You can't occurring. observe a prebiotic world in a postbiotic world. Like we're in the biotic world right now. So everything you observe today is not the same as the prebiotic world. Well, that's an asteroid, there's no life on an asteroid, right? Like, like, so there's no life that's creating these amino acids. When we observe them, well, that's on not asteroid, 100% sure, though, because look, here now, here's something you may not know about the creation model. According to the creation model, the fountains of the deep broke open and shot tons of pieces of rock up into the sky. And that's where you see the shotgun pattern on the moon. All of these rocks that from the fountains of the deep breaking open during the great flood. They would have gone out into space, and now you have all of these molecules in space. So that could be the answer to where all of these chemicals that we see on asteroids come from. Because according to the creation model, the asteroids are just a byproduct of the global flood, which means that it came from Earth that was already created. Now your theory is saying, oh no, there was no flood, so we can't use that answer. 
So you're just having to say, oh, it, it was somehow created in a star. But you can't prove that just like I can't prove that the that all asteroids come from the global flood. But see, this is the problem, though, is you're trying to – there's a line between science and our foundation, our religion, our our faith. So And what I'm you're trying saying- to do – so what I'm you're trying to do that- is you're trying to keep the line solid on my side of the interpretation, but you want to erase the line on your side of the interpretation, and you can't do that. So I'm not saying that um, like life or these things or like the building blocks were formed in stars, right? They're they're formed in like mo- like molecular clouds of uh, like molecules, right? We we can see that. We don't have to just look at only asteroids that would have in your model come from the Earth, right? not all the stars and all the nebulas and all of the gas in the whole universe came from the earth from the flood, right? So we can look at other areas that are outside of our solar system, outside of our galaxy, and we can go and look at like molecular clouds and we can do look at spectroscopy, look at the ones that are containing carbon. And we see that they're in complex organic formations. Like they're in these polycyclic aromatic rings um, that are like, you know, like, glucose or benzene or all these kind of exotic formations and we see them right now like you know they exist out there in the universe they're being formed by natural processes right but you don't see that's the thing though like yes they do exist yes we may be able to see them but we don't know that they were formed by natural processes that's your interpretation that's evolution's interpretation so see that's what i was saying is that we we both see facts we both observe data but then you, there's a line between science and our interpretation. And what you want to do is you want to erase the line on your side and make your interpretation a part of the science. But then you want to say yours has to have that solid line and you can't have it no matter what. And that's not how it works. We're both interpreting data based on what we believe. You believe it came from natural processes. I believe God created it. There's no way that you can prove it came from natural processes without redoing it. And you can't redo it in a biotic life, biotic world. You have to go back to the biotic world to prove that. And you can't. So again, this is where we have a paradox. You have a question, we have a question that we're trying to get the answer to, but we can't get the question in the world we're in. We have to create a new world and, and redo it there, so to say. And yep. maybe that that's why they're trying to test certain things at CERN. But the the the, the, the whole moral of the story here is that. Until we can solid prove these theories in the conditions that they would have been in in that stage of the universe, we can't prove them because you can test things in today's world all day. But it's in today's world where things already exist and we can go to the lab and grab a chemical and mix it in and we can you know, go out into nature and pick a leaf and dissect that leaf and take chemicals out of it. And there's things we can do in today's world that would not have existed in the previous stages of the universe. And that's what I'm saying is that we're both taking interpretations and you're just trying to make yours a fact when it's not a fact. Okay. So is your stance then that like the mechanisms of abiogenesis are like, like beyond just unknowable? Like, are you, are you trying to say that they, there's like no possible like naturalistic process that could create life from non-life Or are you just saying that these things can never be known? So I would like, I'm not saying we should stop trying to find the answers, but I'm saying in the world that we're in today, there's so many variables that would not exist previously that it seems like it is almost impossible to answer this question because every, every article I've looked at, where a synthetic chemist creates these proteins or or creates these amino acids or puts them in a structure to make a building block. They're taking these, they're taking already existing chemicals that are purified bases in their lab and using these purified bases to create them. The thing is in a prebiotic world, one, they wouldn't have been purified bases. They would have been mixed with everything else. Two, they wouldn't have the intelligence to put them together unless you want to start adhering to the creation model where there's an intelligent designer. And three, we don't see anywhere in the in the world today where it happens naturally out of nothing. Now you said we can see lipids creating, uh, we can see lipids creating the bubble in the ocean, and then that bubble will create the building blocks. But again, the lipid has to be created first. And then your answer to that is 
well, it came from the stars exploding or, you know, it came from the sea vents, but we don't see them being created from scratch anywhere. So that's an assumption. That's an interpretation. The difference between interpretation and science is that science is something we can actually prove. And the thing is, we have to be able to, in order to test it, we have to be able to replicate the previous environment. So I guess, yes, to shorten everything down, and it is in a sense impossible to prove a biogenesis because we will we don't have we can't re replicate those conditions so to say um yeah I, I don't know i think that we can at least try to uh replicate the prebiotic conditions i mean that's what they're doing in origin of life research i understand what you're saying is like you know we can never know for sure if this is the prebiotic conditions and you know the, these are controlled laboratory environments so I understand what you're saying there. I'm not saying that we know the exact mechanism for abiogenesis mm -hmm. by any means, but I think that, you know, we have seen uh, lipids being formed in like, like by, by like hydrothermal vents. I mean, we have seen like amino acids occurring naturally um, in the universe. So a lot of these building blocks, I'm not seeing the big issue. I think that we have plenty of evidence that at least these building blocks are formed naturally. And I would just encourage anyone to check out the amyloid world hypothesis. That's one of my favorite ones and it doesn't get enough attention in, in the media. So if you don't know it, check it out, do some research. And I like talking about these kinds of things a lot. So gentlemen, yeah, let me yeah, jump in real quick. This is definitely a new one. Um, I, again, gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to jump in real quick, Jamie. Jamie. <laughs> okay. So we got 10 minutes left in the discussion. Let's do this. We've talked about uh, organic evolution or abiogenesis for quite a lot of time now. Let's spend the final 10 minutes on macroevolution. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie. There we go. That's the next point. So let's go into macroevolution and we will wrap it up on that point. And we've got about 10, maybe we'll extend it to about 12 minutes. And again, we're going to have a shorter audience Q&A than we typically do, because with a topic this heavy, we want to be as comprehensive as possible. Jamie and Grayson, I think you gentlemen both agree. Big bang to evolution. And so we don't want to wrap up the debate without uh, some discourse on macroevolution. So, Jamie, floor is yours. Yeah, so uh, we'll we'll keep macroevolution short. So hopefully we can get some more questions because um, there's it's a pretty obvious topic. I mean, you're going to know most of the talking points that we're going to talk about anyway. Um, but as far as macroevolution goes, I'll go through my slides, um, but I might just you know cut out a couple slides just to keep it simple. Uh, macroevolution is supposed to be the process of changing from one kind to another. But again, this has never been observed. Um, now I know where he's going to, the first thing he's going to talk about is what is a kind and, you know, we're going to start arguing those lines there. Um, but neither here nor there, one kind is going into another. We've never seen that. In fact, all observations show that this will never happen, no, ma no matter how much time is added. There are too many changes that would be required to take place simultaneously to turn one kind of animal into another. The obvious argument to prove this would be to compare the reproductive systems of different animals. Um, I actually wanted to change that. I just didn't have time to get to that slide. Um, but the the I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna kind of take a 180 here. Instead of talking about reproductive systems, uh, what I want to talk about is <clears throat> the obvious argument to prove this would be uh, the breathing systems. You know, we can't explain how a uh, uh, air or, or uh, photosynthesis bacteria would then be able to successfully transition to a gill breathing fish. And then that gill breathing fish successfully transition to be a air breathing mammal. Okay. In order for that to happen, it would require punctuated equilibrium because as soon as you cut off the supply of the previous breathing model, the animal is going to die unless the new breathing model is immediately operating. Now, um, I thought I added this in here, but I guess I didn't. Um, when I did the uh, debate against Luca, I showed the systems of breathing and how complicated they are and how many different things need to be created for them. The gill system is a very complex mechanism. The lung system is a very complex mechanism. And we can't explain how that would happen slowly or quickly. Because in order for it to happen quickly, a lot of things would have to accidentally happen at one time. Um, I'm not going to talk about the law of monophyly because it's just ridiculous. Like the law of monophyly, honestly, I don't even understand why evolutionists bring it up because it just makes your theory impossible. Um, but the thing I want to focus on and that I want to talk about with Grayson is more 
the uh, breathing systems and how that would possibly happen. Um, the main reason that I find this important is because from observation, we see that there is limitations to the genetic pool. So you're never going to get a elephant with wings because it doesn't have that information in its gene pool. Now, when you say the word information, you're now implying that someone put it there. That is a that is a uh, evidence of design, so to say. Um, so that's where I'll leave that at because this is kind of a basic uh, slide presentation for macroevolution. There's a lot of things that I would much rather talk about as far as macroevolution than what's on this presentation. Okay, sweet. So the, the first thing I'll say is just the evidence for macroevolution, right? Genetic sequence homology, uh, the order of the fossil record, and the existence of mosaic fossils are some of my three favorite. Oh, can you say one more time so I can write them down? Yeah, yeah. So genetic sequence homology. So just like the the similarities in patterns of DNA that we see between species and the nested hierarchy patterns that they form. And then uh, the order of the fossils in the fossil record, and then the existence of mosaic fossils, like, and the kinds of mosaic fossils that we observe, like in the, in the patterns that we observe. Now, those are my. Now, when you say when you say mosaic fossils, are you talking about index fossils? No. So uh, a mosaic fossil would be like a fossil that has attributes that are kind of mosaic, like they're kind of intermediate between um, two oh, okay, different okay, kinds okay. of okay. organisms. Um, so like this would be like I'm using kind of mosaic fossils instead of like transitionary forms, I guess you could be talking about like Tiktaalik okay. is a mosaic right. fossil, okay. Archaeopteryx is a mosaic fossil, um, like, you know, those different kinds of uh, mosaic forms that we find in the fossil record. But to, to address your point specifically about um, the evolution of these kind of complex systems like like respiratory systems. So like the very first organisms did not have any gills or lungs or any kind of respiration system. Like they got their oxygen to all of their cells because their cells were in direct contact with water. So if, if the cell is going through um, like oxygen, so multicellularity would have evolved after photosynthesis. The photosynthetic bacteria did not evolve into um, like animals though, that, but whatever. So the, all of the cells had to be direct, in direct contact with the water, okay? So they were naturally absorbing the oxygen through the cellular membrane based on like different uh, concentration gradients. But if a cell was not in direct contact with the water, then it could no longer um, absor absorb that oxygen from the water. So you didn't need a respiratory system when you have something simple like a sponge, right? We have sponges, they don't have any gills or anything like that all of their cells are in direct contact with the water. So they don't need a respiratory system. As soon as you start having uh, types of animals that have internal cavities that are not facing the outside environment, then you need some kind of system to deliver oxygen to them. So like cells and a circulatory system, anything that essentially moves around the, the material from inside to outside um, is, is going to accomplish uh, this uh, feet. And so um, also, I would just want to point out when you're saying like the, the transition between gills and lungs, there are lots of fish that have both. So like a coelacanth is a good example. It's a really ancient kind of fish. It has both lungs and gills. And its lungs, I don't believe are even functional in terms of respiration. Like they cannot breathe through their lungs, they breathe through their gills, but they still have lungs. So those lungs are, are, are doing another kind of function or they're vestigial. I don't know the, exactly the function of coelacanth lungs, but the, the fish can have both. And it, it doesn't have to, as soon as it gets lungs, it has to get rid of its gills or like the, the transition can happen where you can have both of them, um, occurring simultaneously. Okay. So uh, first thing you said, genetic sequence homology or homology. Um, the first thing I would say about that is that doesn't, automatically prove evolution what you're doing is you're comparing genetic sequences and seeing similarities that could also be similar design features from an intelligent designer uh, so i'll go ahead and mark that one off my list the second thing was you said order of fossils um i know you've debated kent like four times so you should already know this there's we have answers for fossils okay fossils came by the flood hydrologic sorting university of colorado does great studies on this with that french professor so go check out that video of uh stratification uh, the second thing was mosaic fossils, intermediary fossils. Now, there's no such thing as intermediary fossil. You see an animal that doesn't exist today, 
And because it has features that you can put with two different creatures that do exist today, you say, oh, that's it. There's the ancestor. That's not how it works, okay? You can't prove that that intermediary fossil, that creature that created that intermediary fossil, you can't prove that it split off to be both of these. You can assume that. You can interpret that. But again, line between interpretation and science, don't blur your line. Uh, the next thing you said was fish and lizards both have lungs and um, gills. Now, I have seen some creatures that have lungs and gills. It's not just fish. It's also lizards. You didn't mention the lizards, but I'll go ahead and mention it for you. There are some lizards apparently that have gills. Um, now, you said some of those, uh, I think you said the coelacanth, it doesn't use its lungs, right? The lungs are the ones that are supposed to be vestigial. Well, Again, you said there might be a purpose for it, and there probably is a purpose for it that we don't know because we've only found a limited amount of coelacanths, and we thought they were gone for millions of years. So we have very limited research on this creature. Um, the other thing was maybe it did function at one point in time, and it lost its function. Now, if it lost its function, that means we're losing information. We're not gaining information. Therefore, it's the opposite of macroevolution. It's de-evolution. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was you mentioned Tiktaalik and I just want to say that I was working on my evolution exposed video series and for episode three, I was going to start with fossil frauds. And then from there, I kind of went down a rabbit hole with uh, human to ape evolution. So that's where the documentary came into play because now my episode three is actually going to be a documentary on human to ape evolution where I take every single evidence of apes that have been used for this evolutionary process and just completely debunk every single one of them. But before that, I was actually doing just fossil frauds and Tiktaalik is on that list. There is a lot of evidence that that is very sound evidence from what I've seen that proves that Tiktaalik is a combination of two different animals with three different pieces that were put together to prove this. I have the photos in my uh, folder but I don't know how long it would take me to pull them up, and I really don't want to keep people waiting on that. But there's photos of the original discovery at the dig site. of the, And again, on episode four of Evolution Exposed, I'll have all the photos and all the videos and everything on that. So I recommend you all keep an eye out for that episode when it's done. But at the dig site of Tiktaalik, the head was found on the edge of a mountain, and then the body was found, I think, two or three layers below the head completely separate. So the body of the organism is a fish. The head is a baby alligator from what it looks like in the dig site. So it looks like what we're looking at is a Frankenstein fossil fraud of two completely different animals put together. Also, not just the body and the head were separate when, when they were discovered, but also the little fin that they love to use for the evidence of fins turning into legs that fin was also detached and in a different layer. So you're looking at three different pieces of a fossil that were put together to make this imaginary tiktaalik creature. So again, that proves nothing. That that just goes to show that fossils are not reliable. You can't you can't prove they existed the way that they're presenting them. You can't prove that they had babies or that they had populations of that. And it could have just been a mutated alligator, you know, like just like how we have humans that that are born today and they have a little stumpy arm that doesn't mean they evolved that means that they had a mutation that you know means that their arm didn't fully develop in embryo and then also even if that wasn't a, a bad uh, uh, unsuccessful development even if it was a completely different creature you can't prove that it had babies that created this branch of new organisms that you now are presenting it as so again lots of assumptions built in you can have your interpretation you can just like I can have my religion, you can have your religion, but don't don't erase your line between interpretations okay. and science. Okay, I gotta butt in here because you said so much. Uh, the first of all, it doesn't matter whether any of these uh, mosaic fossils had any descendants of any kind. Like all of their lines could have gone it extinct. Does matter? <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't not matter at all for the sake of argument that I'm making. I'm saying that the existence of these mosaic fossils. It, like they, they didn't have to have any children or anything of the kind. The fact that they exist and they have these qualities is the evidence because the types of mosaic fossils that we find are the types of fossils that are predicted by evolution. We don't find mosaic fossils with intermediate uh, qualities between two different organisms that evolution said we should not find together. We only find the ones that are predicted. Like Tiktaalik, for example, was predicted. 
uh, it, and like it was predicted to occur in this certain <laughs> layer. We went and looked in that layer. We found it. What you're speaking about with Tiktaalik is that I think that you're kind of misunderstanding that they're they're claiming that there's just one specimen found. No, there's like two or three different specimens of Tiktaalik, two like two or three separate individuals that were found in that dig. It's not just saying that there was one specimen. So like th there were multiple individuals. That's why they're in different locations, right? Um, well, and then no, that's not true though, because when you look at the photos of the dig site, you find the skull is encased in rock and it's by itself. There's no body connected to it. Then you find a body completely separate from the skull in a different layer and they combine that to create an imaginary animal. So that is a fraudulent discovery. So no, it's not it's <laughs> they, fraudulent, like, dude. These it's, are it's different individuals. Fraud. They're not saying that they're from the same individual, right? They're like, the but they put it together species. to make it one animal. So yeah, they're that's a fraud. Species. And the mosaic qualities are not simply just the skull versus the rest. I mean, this thing had a neck, it had shoulders, it had wrists. I mean, it, it had a lot of mosaic qualities that are not the same. And when you talk about human evolution, Australopithecus is the number one thing that you would need to disprove, which I don't think you're going to do. You're probably going to focus the whole time on specifically Lucy and ignore the fact that we have found lots of other specimens like Dakika child or, or like like multiple different specimens of Australopithecus. It's not just the one. And a lot of these specimens we find where like the actual mosaic parts of them are found articulated together. It's not like they're found in different environments. They're literally found articulated, buried together. So that like shows that they're not just pulling from different organisms and putting them together. Like these are actually individuals with mosaic features. So then um, you said that hydrologic, hydrologic sorting can explain the order in the fossil record. Absolutely not. Uh, there, the hydrologic, there's no order of density. There's no order of body complex. Like there's no order <coughs> of like mobility, no order of intellect, intelligence. Like the, the ordering that we see in the fossil record cannot be described by hydrologic sorting. There's no mechanism that could possibly explain that. It's literally the order of the fossil record is impossible to explain explain other than macro evolution and then um, you said it could be common design rather than common ancestry for the genetic similarities uh, ju that's just not true um, we can look at like if that were the case then you should be able to use common design to make predictions about which species should be more similar genetically than others and these predictions utterly fail. You cannot use common design to make these kind of predictions. The, the example I gave in the last debate was a goldfish. And if you were going to compare goldfish's DNA with a shark's or a human's, common design would say that it would be more similar to a shark than to a human. But in reality, the DNA is more similar between humans and goldfish than sharks and goldfish. So common design cannot make testable predictions. Or like it can, but they fail the test. I mean, they get falsified. So that's why it's not common design. Um, and there's also patterns of DNA similarity in regions that are not even functional. Like they, 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 they don't have any kind of genes that they're coding for, any kind of design elements to them. And we still see the same patterns of nested hierarchy in these, in these sequences. So it, common design is not sufficient to explain these DNA patterns. So I think the biggest problem you have with common design is that you completely misunderstand what it proposes because you're used to common ancestry. And according to common ancestry, there's this gradual transition. And so the more similar things are, the closer they are to each other. That's not what common design is saying. It's not saying that because like, I know Kent says this, like, uh, because the foot works on the dog, then it would work on the bear. Like that's not, that's not a hundred percent what common design is. Common design is saying that we can see so we can see similarities between creatures. We can see differences between creatures, but in the end, when you look at the genetic structure, the genetic structures are almost always identical in some way, no matter what creature you have. And because of that, it looks like there's a type of coding language. Now you can have a million different programs from different designers and and different uh, and different coders that do different things but they're all using a similar language. That's all that common design means is that there's a, there's a language that everything is being written off of. That doesn't mean that they have to be, just like you said with the goldfish and the shark and the human, that doesn't mean that they have to be follow that line of similarity to be common, okay? 
That's not what common design is saying. What common design is saying is that the shark, the human, and the goldfish are using the same language to write the code. And that's all we're saying by that. And that's easily verifiable by looking at coding today. That's how humans work. We work off of coding the same way that DNA works. And when you look at that, that almost shows that we're taking after our creator that made us. Because we are made in the image of God, we are trying to design similar to how he would design. So even though we have one program that, let's say, StreamYard, right? StreamYard, you know, it does live streams. It has all these different features. But guess what? The language for StreamYard is probably identical in very many aspects to PowerPoint. They do two completely different things. So then what Visually, you're saying then is that common design cannot explain the, the patterns of similarity in DNA that we see between species because all species use DNA. So no, if I'm not all saying species that. use DNA. I'm not saying it can't I'm not saying it can't explain it. What I'm saying though is that it's not limited to that. You're trying to put it in a box and say that you have to stay within this box or else you're wrong. And that's so not can what you is. use common design to make a prediction? If I say, what is more similar, this animal and this animal or this animal and that animal, can common design ever be used to make a prediction about which animals have more similar DNA? Well, let me ask. Okay, so let me ask you. Because evolution okay. can't. Yeah. So let me ask. No, it can't. Because what you're doing is you're taking things that you already have a presupposed answer for and you're just trying to add, you're trying to implement your answer onto these things. And that's not how it works, okay? That's just like with the fossils. You say, oh, we'll find this fossil in this layer, but then you go and create the fossil. So it's not like you're not finding it in there. You're making it to fit it. You're manipulating the data to fit what you want it to say. Now, as far as can we make predictions of the goldfish and the shark and which one's closer the, to the human, that's not – that's I mean, you can kind of, you can try and make those assumptions, but you're not limited to those assumptions because I could ask you this: I could say which is more similar to Streamyard, PowerPoint, or or um, which is more similar to Streamline, PowerPoint or Adobe Photoshop. I mean, like you're talking about different created things. They use the same language, but they are in no way intertwined with each other. That's what I'm saying is that you want everything to fit your chain. But there is no chain. So therefore, you're taking your assumptions and your interpretations and requiring us on the creation side to fit your assumptions. And that's not how it works for science. Okay, Yours is not science, so you can't make us follow your structure. And then as far as predictions, there's plenty of creationists that make predictions. I, I'm, I'm, I know you watch Nathaniel Jensen and the whole Traced project. And as much as you want to deny it, there is groundbreaking discovery in there and all across the world, except for America, they accept this as groundbreaking discoveries. So I'm sorry that you don't want to accept it, but it is what it is. He's making groundbreaking discoveries. Just because he doesn't get your Nobel Prize doesn't mean that it's not a breakthrough in science. Gentlemen, since we have two minutes, well, less than two minutes now, <laughs> um, <laughs> great job. You guys uh, demonstrated some excellent endurance. And so you both have obviously accumulated some beneficial information, adding mutations that allow you to go nonstop for a two hour discussion. So why don't we, because Grayson, I'm sure there's a couple of things that you want to say there. Grayson, let's give you, um, I know you're not a big fan of uh, cl closing statements. So let's consider more of a wrapping up of thoughts <laughs> and points. <laughs> so take two minutes, Grayson. Jamie, you get two minutes. And then we're going to get through, uh, you know, some of these questions and then we're going to wrap it up. It's my understanding that Grayson has an after show over on uh, based theory. And so uh, we want to give, you know, him the opportunity to host that as well. So, Grayson, go ahead. Take, uh, let's say, up to two minutes and um, floor is yours. Yeah, OK. So tonight we had a, a big topic for discussion, you know, the, the Big Bang and evolution and everything in between. And I'm actually surprised by how much ground we were able to cover. Yeah, Donnie was yeah. right. We were talking about for like two and a half hours almost. So we definitely covered a lot of ground. Um, I think that I was able to fairly respond to a lot of the criticisms that Jamie brought up. I think that we do have a lot more of a back and forth to go on about uh, macro evolution, for example, I think that we could talk endlessly. We didn't get to talk about Clamidomotus at all. Um, yeah. 
And, and that's a big one that I want to discuss with Jamie. So there's a lot of ground to cover on macroevolution, but I, I think that we discussed a lot of the topics in between a lot. Um, this was kind of my first time talking about the Big Bang and abiogenesis and some of these things. So I'm glad that we got to give those topics their fair shake because we spend a lot of time talking about evolution on this channel and other debates. So I'm glad that we got to that. Um, just in the point of saying, um, you know, it's all the same uh, computer programming language, just like it's all the same DNA. So that's what common design is, refer is re referring to. Well, I don't think that that really allows us to make any kinds of predictions. I mean, like evolution, like I said, you can take two species and you can use evolution to predict if they will have like what degree of genetic homology they will have. Like you actually have... Um, real genuine patterns of DNA sequence similarities that we observe and test in the field of genetics. These are not just random patterns. These are like actually forming real observable nested hierarchical patterns of genetic similarity. And that is what needs to be explained. So if common design doesn't explain that because common design just kind of stops at saying they have similar genetics, they all use DNA, then common design is not really helpful in explaining that pattern. So that pattern of DNA sequences, similarities, is what I'm pointing to as the evidence uh, for macroevolution in the field of genetics. Um, in, in terms of the mosaic uh, fossils and the ordering of the fossil record, hydrologic sorting just is not going to cut it for that. And just the fact that, you know, he's basically going to a conspiracy or calling the mosaic fossils frauds. And I think that in a debate like this, where there isn't a lot of trust going on both sides, if, if I can get my opponent to the point where he has to admit either it's a conspiracy or it's a coincidence, then I, I think that I've made my point uh, well enough for any, you know, logically minded person listening. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, Jamie, or uh, Grayson, thanks for the two minutes. Uh, Jamie from Studio 215 Official, we're going to hand it to you. You can take uh, two minutes as well, then we'll, we'll get into some questions. Go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, he kind of reiterated most of the talking points that we went over, so I'm not really going to touch on those. Uh, there's something much more important I'd like to talk to for my last closing two minutes. Um, I know I did this on my last debate, but I'm going to clarify it again. I don't know everything. Grayson doesn't know everything. Standing for Truth doesn't know everything. Everyone in the world combined, our knowledge still does not touch on everything that could possibly be learned. Okay, there is someone that does know everything, and that is God. God is out there. He shows his design. He shows his existence through his design. And there's something important that I want to mention here. Romans 6.23 is the most important verse. If you don't take anything else, listen to this one verse. For the wages of sin is death. We all sin. We are all going to die. There is a first death and a second death. And you will meet that second death if you don't accept the Savior. The thing is, you don't have to meet that second death. The gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift and you could accept it. Now, if you choose to reject it and stand on your own understanding, you're going to constantly find that what you think is truth is going to be redefined and you're going to have to change your theory and you're going to have to change again and again and again every year for the rest of time because your understanding is not the understanding of God. God gave us a book. He gave us all the answers. And even though you want to reject him, he's ready to give you the gift of eternal life. He's ready to give you all the answers you need. When I was in your place as an atheist, I was very advent in rejecting God. And when I decided to finally accept God, I specifically said in my prayers, it's like, I have a lot of questions that I need answers to. And by opening my heart up to hearing his voice, he gave me the answers I need. And that's how I'm here today. I'm not here today because I took a whole bunch of classes in college and learned every single every single word in the dictionary. I'm here today because when you accept Christ, he gives you the answers that you need to have faith and have confidence in his existence. So for those of y'all that are listening that are atheists, I would recommend you stop rejecting God and accept that eternal life gift that he's waiting to give you. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay for the wages of your sin by yourself. Jesus is the only way to pay for those wages. Jamie, I appreciate those uh, final words, final thoughts. And again, gentlemen, fantastic debate. You both kept it uh, very cordial on topic, as Grayson put it. I mean, it's a heavy topic, big bang to evolution. And uh, we covered a lot of ground. 
That was very thorough. We, we got good discussion on every topic right up to macro evolution. And so we've had a, an excellent chat as well. We've had over 130 people enjoying this debate live. And so I, I think a round two where we can focus maybe just on macro evolution and micro evolution would be a good idea for the future. Okay, so with that, let's get into let's get into some questions. So let's start off with, um, you know, I'll go right to the beginning and start with Centurion seven three seven. Thanks so much for the question. Questions for you, Grayson. If the observable universe is 13.7 billion years old, how can the same observable universe be 93 billion light years across? Because the expansion of space and time is not uh, bound by the speed of light. So space and time can expand faster than the speed of light. That doesn't mean that anything within the universe has actually moved faster than the speed of light. Thank you, Grayson. Jamie, anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think the question kind of speaks for itself. The numbers don't add up. And I mean, they can, you know, come up with all these crazy answers for how to fix the gap of numbers. But at the end of the day, it doesn't add up no matter what answer you give it. Grayson, you want the last word? Yeah, sure. It adds up based on our current observations of the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, that's how we get those numbers in the first place. So we observe the expansion of space and time. And, you know, we, we can observe that today. We know the rates. So but we have like very close estimates of the rates. So I don't think that the numbers are mismatched. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, for your responses. Grayson, uh, appreciate your, your final word. So here we go. Next question comes in. From Gate Watchers, question for Grayson. So, Grayson, you're on the hot seat tonight, it seems, in terms of the Q&A period. I have fossilized or petrified bananas and banana tree from 10,000 feet elevation in NM. Somewhere in the States, maybe. I'm Canadian. New Mexico. New Mexico. New Me oh, there we go. Okay. So, did the surfing monkeys bring them here? Go ahead. No. Short and sweet. Short and sweet. <laughs> Jamie, you want to <laughs> add anything at all? Uh, yeah, there was a bunch of topics we didn't talk that we didn't touch on tonight. But um, yeah, there's a lot of things like that that they can't explain. Just like clams on top of Mount Everest. Just like all of the uh, polystrata fossils. There's a lot of things that they can't explain and doesn't fit their theory. And what they usually do is they try and, like you did earlier, try and write it off as a conspiracy. Uh, but we're not claiming conspiracy. We're just claiming doesn't make sense according to your model. Grace. Okay, so yeah, in previous debates, I have explained poly straight trees. I don't have enough time here, but check out my previous, uh, my first debate with Kent. I explain it. And then um, the other point with clams, I've also explained clams on Mount Everest with Kent. Um, it's just, you know, plague tectonics and mountain formation. And plus, those aren't even really clams. Those are just brachiopods. It's like a more basal form, but that doesn't really have to do with the question. The question was just, I don't know, some claim and then a weird question about serving monkeys. So I don't really even know what to respond other than just no. <laughs> okay, thank you, Grayson and Jamie. <laughs> Uh, let me remind the audience, if they check the description box of this video, they're going to find Jamie's channel, Grayson's channel, and you can also find uh, previous debates uh, with these debaters. Grayson, you've done a number here on the channel. Jamie, you've done a number here as well. Grayson, you've had some debates with Kent. You've had some debates with myself. Jamie, you've debated Snake Was Right, Luca Medugno. So lots of uh, debates for the debate addicts out there to, to enjoy. I do want to remind uh, people before I forget, though. So last week was the first week of uh, 2023, and we had four epic debates. This week, no different. It's, it's a busy week of shows. So tonight, of, of course the much anticipated big bang to evolution debate between Grayson and Jamie. Looks like they're going to maintain their friendship after this. So that's good. I'm happy about that. And uh, Wednesday is going to be the great biblical slavery debate. So praise I am and James W. And then uh, the very next day, Thursday at six o'clock, EST, I've got Dr. Grady McMurtry here, and this is going to be fun. This is going to be two hours of audience questions and answers. 
And so the second the show kicks off, I'll give a few words of introduction, of course, but then we are just going to have a show entirely dedicated to interacting with the audience. And so questions to do with age of the earth, creation, evolution, and related topics, please, you know, send them in. You can even send them to me ahead of time through email. I'll save them and uh, we will allow Dr. Grady to to address him. And then uh, we'll wrap the week up. We've got Dr. Dan Biddle. He'll be back here from Genesis Apologetics, Dinosaurs, Man, Creation, and the Flood. So lots to look forward to. Okay, next question comes in from Taylor K. Taylor, thank you for the question. Question for Grayson. How did the carbon molecules that struck Earth on a meteorite from outer space assemble themselves into the first living cell? Oh, Grace, needed. I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. So it's a huge question, Taylor. The most honest answer I can give is honestly, I don't know the mechanism <laughs> for that. So the original organic molecules, we can describe the different uh, formation processes for some of these building blocks. But getting all the way up to the first living cell is a huge uh you know, I mean, there could be entire dissertations written on that and they would barely even cover the ground for that topic. So I think that the key intermediate that we would need is a self-replicating uh, chemical system. So that would be pre-cell, but post-building blocks. And so there are lots of different hypotheses for this. Uh, the, the two main ones that I think are big right now are metabolism first. So a chemical system of metabolism before these first living cells. And then, like I said before, the amyloid world hypothesis, which I'm quite partial to, but I'm not claiming that either of these definitively are the mechanism by which it happens. Um, at this point in time, we do not know the mechanism. So the answer would be, you know, I don't know right now. Thank you, Grayson. Jamie, anything you'd like to add? Well, I mean, I, I think he's uh, right on the head there. He does not know. And that's exactly the point that I'm making is that this is a huge part of the theory and you just don't know. And just like a lot of the other things, but yet you still got to have the theory. And if you don't follow that theory, then, you know, it, it, it's not science, but still. Um, it, what's funny about that is um, actually there's a clip from a debate with James Tour and another synthetic chemist that, uh, that uh, believes in evolution. And he gets him through all these questions and he says, and, he, and, and finally at the end of the questions, he gets him to admit, we both know that they're here. So it had to have happened, but we don't know how. And as soon as he realizes that he admitted, they don't know how it was like a truck hit him. The face he made when he realized I really can't answer these questions. And I mean, I wish that the rest of you guys would realize this. You don't have the answer to the questions. So therefore stop acting like it's science. Okay, well, I I did realize it. I was the one that said that we don't know the mechanism. I mean, like I already said, we know that abiogenesis happened. We know that at one point in the universe's history, there was no life. And then at the point now, there is life. So we know that at some point, something did happen that caused life to come from non-life. Whether or not you believe that this is a god or without a god or what mechanism, amyloid world or metabolism first, we don't know the exact mechanism we know what happened, but yeah, I mean, I'm the first one to admit that we don't know, but I mean, just saying, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that science doesn't know everything. I don't know everything and I'm completely okay with there being uh, questions that don't have answers yet. And we don't have a complete and total understanding. I'm completely okay with admitting and it being totally okay that we don't know some things. Thank you, Grayson, for the final word. Next question comes in from creationist crybaby. Question for Jamie. All the cells today are the product of billions of years of evolution. Why would you think the earliest self-replicator and protein-building systems were not much simpler? Okay, so first, I see creationist crybaby all the time. Are you Atheist Junior? I have to know. Put it in the comments because I'm like so sure that this is atheist junior but i'm not, not 100 okay ne neither here nor there <clears throat> now he's first starting with an assumption that billions of years was there and again you can't prove that you don't know that but then you're going on to say how do we know that they were not much simpler in the past well the best thing i would say is let's look at observation what do we see today we see that things are deteriorating they're getting worse over time they're not getting better over time 
So therefore, by your theory and by your question, you're saying that it's getting better and it's getting more complicated. But then what we observe is that it's getting worse and less complicated. It's actually deteriorating and then things are start are starting to go extinct because of that. So observation shows the opposite of what you're assuming. Okay, so I just want to say that uh, there is not an observation of that happening. Uh, that's an assumption on your part. There is no observations that show genetic entropy is a real thing that is happening. Um, Donnie and I have had debates on this. I'll debate anybody on this topic. Genetic entropy is not real. These things are, are not being degraded over time. It, it, this is not what is observed. Okay, thank you for the final words there, Grayson. Moving on, redefine living. Yeah, I think the question was for Jamie, sorry. Oh, Jamie, you're right. I'm so used to these being for Grayson. Jamie, you get the last <laughs> word this time. So defend genetic entropy for us. I'm just kidding, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it kind of just goes into the fact that we do observe it. Um, if you want to do a debate on that, then so be it. We can do that. But, I mean, it's pretty obvious just from basic observation. The more we try and advance a crop, the more unstable it becomes without being monitored. The more humans replicate with each other, the more mutations we see, the more diseases we see. There's diseases that exist today that didn't exist 100 years ago. There's diseases that exist 100 years ago that didn't exist 1,000 years ago. So yes, observation shows genetic entropy. Okay, Jamie, appreciate the final words. Gentlemen, keeping this... Q&A portion moving smoothly. Okay, redefine living. He's coming at you, Grayson. He's saying he's asking, is there any observational evidence that space-time can expand faster than the speed of light? Um yeah, sure. There's like physics that would show that there's 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 no violation in the laws of physics in this happening. Um there, there's very good reasons why the speed of light is the speed of light and why that's a limit for matter and energy to travel at. We can derive the speed of light from more simple physics. Um so there's good reasons to understand that. And like I said, Hubble's law can can pretty much show us that um that the space time is expanding faster than the speed of light because we know that matter and energy cannot travel faster than the speed of light. That's what we know from the laws of physics. And then when we look at Hubble's law, we look at the, based on like really far distant objects away, appear as though they are moving faster than the speed of light because there's such a, a huge amount of space between us that the expansion within that space time red shifts the light faster than any object could possibly be traveling fast like away from us so hubble's law is demonstrable that space time is expanding faster than light okay thank you grayson jamie so there's one interesting thing i just want to point out to that will um kind of change the way you look at this question the speed of light is not a constant it's been proven. They can slow it down. They can speed it up. They've actually had to adjust the atomic clock or nuclear clock. I forgot the term for it. They've had to adjust it because the speed of light is slowing down. So therefore, since the speed of light is not a constant, it's not a proper way to measure things. I don't know how that ties into um, can the observational evidence that space time expands faster than the speed of light. I don't know how that ties into that. But I just want to point out the speed of light is not a constant. So this isn't an accurate way to measure things. Okay, so yeah, the speed of light definitely is a constant. Speed of light in a vacuum, uh, it like I said, you you can calculate this, and all you need is like the vacuum permittivity and the vacuum permeability. Using those two factors, you can calculate the speed of light. It it is that reason for it is that speed for a limit uh, for a reason. And what you're talking about with the experiment slowing down and speeding up the speed of light that you got to deepen your understanding on that because the actual individual photons are not changing speed. Like they are still traveling at the same speed, the speed of light. The reason that it appears that the light is speeding up and slowing down is because of the interactions with the medium. So when it goes through a different medium, the individual photons are being nope. absorbed and emitted by the atoms in that medium. But the actual photons are traveling in between the atoms of the medium at the speed of light. It does not change. The, uh, like the macro effect from all these absorptions and emissions make it appear as if the, the group of light particles is moving slower than the speed of light in a vacuum, but each individual photon is still moving at the same speed 
and it's physically incapable of traveling at any other speed other than that. Thank you, Grayson. And it was your question. So we'll move on to the next comes in from Tanya Brown. Tanya, appreciate the question. Question for Grayson. Doesn't the singularity have arbitrary starting conditions, which don't necessarily operate according to the known laws of physics? Um, no. So we flat up do not have the math to describe the singularity. The singularity is a mathematical <laughs> artifact. It, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's a part of the math that mm. shows us that our math is insufficient. So it, there's, we don't know anything about the starting conditions for the singularity. We don't know any of those physics. Like it's not a part of the theory. Like the, 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 the theory does not describe the singularity. Okay. The singularity is an unknown. So we don't know about any of the starting conditions. Uh, again, it's not part of the Big Bang Theory. Thank you. I was just pinning your message or your after show in the chat there, Grayson, for people to check out. Jamie, anything you'd like to add, brother? <laughs> yeah. Um, so for those watching, if, you, if you're a drinker, I would encourage you to come back and watch this episode and every time he says, we don't know, take a drink, by the end of the live stream, you will have alcohol poisoning because it's like every single thing we talk about, we don't know about this. We don't know about that. We don't know about this. But it's a fact because evolution. So that's it. Okay, so Jamie. for everyone doing the drinking game, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. Um, <laughs> but I think it's totally okay not to know everything. Mm. Like I said, I mean, I'm not claiming to have all the answers for everything. All I'm saying is... These are what we can say based on the evidence that we have. So if we don't have evidence to substantiate something, like if we don't have the mathematics to describe it, I'm not going to make any claims about it. And I'm completely OK with saying that we don't know something. I think that it's totally fine. And you kind of have to accept in life that there are a lot of things that you're not going to know about. And it's fine to not know everything or not have all the answers. It's a lot more interesting, honestly, when you don't have all the answers and you can, you know, follow these questions and try to find new answers and new <laughs> questions and new evidence. So I think that's totally fine. And I have no problem admitting when I don't know something or when science or our scientific theories don't know everything. I'm sorry. I just have to say this in the chat. This guy is cracking me up. Uh, Mistletoe. He said, we don't know translation. This is our religion. <laughs> that's essentially what it boils down to right there. Well, those are fighting words, Grayson. What are you going <laughs> to say to that? Yeah, I don't think that there's any similarity with the religion. I mean, I'm not invoking any supernatural powers or gods or um, there's no religious ceremonies or rituals or prayers that go on with any of this. So I don't think it meets any of the criteria for a religion. You don't have to have those criteria to be religion. You just have to have a faith based belief system. And that's evolution. Okay, so I have faith that my car is right where I parked it the last time I saw it. Is that a religion? Because that includes faith. I mean, that's evidence-based faith, but everything I've been saying all night is evidence-based. Except for the 10,000 we don't knows. Yeah, I don't know if my car is there <laughs> at the moment. I don't I, I don't I don't see it. it. Something could have happened to it. There's a lot of I mean, I don't know a lot about the state of my car at the moment. And it could anything could be happening to it, but I have to have faith that when I walk out of my house, my car is going to be there. So is that a religion? Okay, gentlemen, appreciate you keeping this uh, <laughs> Q&A portion fun, engaging, entertaining. So Sunflower has a question for Grayson or maybe a comment. It is a super chat, so I do want to honor that. Sunflower, I appreciate the support. And so Sunflower has some comments for you, Grayson. Abiogenesis is the most fraught field in all of biology and chemistry. It is a futile sham and people who feel any level of confidence in the proposed theories are delusional beyond belief. So, Gracie, you could respond to that if you'd like. He's he's coming at you. Um, all right, well, I don't think I made any kind of confident claim that any of these mechanisms that I said were the definitive truth that absolutely happened. I mean, I think I was pretty clear that they're just plausible hypotheses. Um, so I, I don't think I was making any delusional claim or any belief based claim. Uh, everything that I said was supported by evidence. And when it wasn't, I was, I freely admitted it. So 
you know, kind of on a repeat record, like, obviously, I'm not coming here claiming I have all the answers about every field of knowledge. Okay, appreciate it, Grayson. Um, you know what, since it was just a comment and not a question, uh, Jamie, let's just move on to the next uh, to keep it fair. And so, okay, Stephen Tibbetts, question for Grayson. If hydrogen and helium are a gas and start to condense due to gravity, how do you get around the compression causing heat and expansion? Also, how does it end up spinning in bracket star? Okay, yeah. So the heat and com and the expansion that are a result of the the gas accumulating, uh, that's going to be a counterbalancing effect to the gravity, right? The gravity is making these things come together, and when you they're brought together, right? There's going to be a counteracting force, like a, a pressure that is trying to push them apart, and that's going to counteract the force of gravity, right? We observe this happening in protostars. We can look up in the sky. We can see protostars today. They're stellar bodies that have not uh, started nuclear fusion yet. So these are the processes at hand. But the uh, force of gravity is greater than those other effects. So the, the, con the accretion continues to happen because the gravity is, is stronger than these other countervailing forces. And then the second question, how does it end up spinning? So when these things start to come together, right, they're going to start spinning. Like that, that's the accretion of this material causes a spinning accretion disk due to the conservation of angular momentum. Oh, so now the angular momentum exists. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of funny that you reject it in one sense, but then accept it in another. This goes back to what I was saying earlier in the debate that anything goes as long as it fits evolution and they only have the answers for what the question at hand is, even though the answer they may give contradicts an answer to another question they gave earlier on so again this is what i'm saying there is no foundation that can be provided with evolution it's just if it, if it sounds like the right answer let's go ahead and say that until they break that down and debunk it and then we'll come up with a new answer it's it's honestly in my opinion evolution is halting our advancements in science okay so if i can just respond to that yeah, really get the last word so yeah, the difference is, is that in the formation of a star and the accretion of molecular clouds of gas in space, there's not a diff, like we're not talking about the expansion of space and time, right? Like that there, there's a clear difference about why uh, angular momentum does not apply, is, is not generated by one, the expansion of space and time, and is generated by like actual objects like that are existing in the universe that each have their own angular momentum like coming together why that's going to cause effects like spinning i mean that there's no expansion of space and time involved in those models like those are all from objects existing in space and time already Grayson, thanks for the final word. Okay, guys, we are about to hit the three-hour mark, so we are going to wind it down here with the final question or comment, actually, as it looks like, from Bubblegum Gun. Grayson, one of your best buds here. And Bubblegum has a $2 comment for you. Grayson, provide a physical quantity of the field. Feel free to respond. However you'd yeah, like to. any any particle is a physical quantity of its associated field. So an electron is a physical quantity of the electron field. A photon is a physical quantity of the electromagnetic field. Literally any particle is definitionally a quantized <laughs> physical quantity of that field. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know what? Since it was more so a comment. Then we gave Grayson the opportunity to respond. We'll just uh, wrap it up there. Jamie, Grayson, I got to say, great debate. Uh, very engaging. I really like these uh, conversation formats because you get to touch on a lot of points. Grayson and Kent's last debate was very similar. And so what I do want to do, though, is give you both the opportunity for some final words, final thoughts. Grayson, let's start with you. You can give your after show a shout out if you'd like to. Again, thanks for doing this. And, you know, although... We would disagree on certain topics. I always appreciate you being willing to, you know, hop on here and, and have some really sophisticated discussions. So, Grayson, thanks again. And final words, final thoughts. Yeah, so I, I actually I thought that this debate went quite well. I wasn't sure what to expect. I was kind of worried that things would get very chaotic and dumpster fiery. <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, 
Mm. We were able to keep it civil. Uh, we weren't, you know, getting rude or interrupting each other. So I, I'd like to, you know, tip my hat to my opponent there. I, I appreciate the nice uh, civilized debate actually about the topics that we came to discuss. So I really appreciate it. I enjoyed myself. Um, I, I, I didn't make any comments about God or gods or, I, you know, I don't really care if you believe in God or don't believe in God. It's not really my prerogative. I'm not trying to change people's uh, beliefs about a creator. I just think, um, you know, that when it interferes with what like evidence based science, that's really what I'm more concerned about and what I want to address in these debates so you know i, I don't want to it's not my goal to change anybody's opinion on on theism well thank you grayson sunflower although he was coming at you earlier he's giving you uh, uh you know some kind words here saying you're polite and respectful this debate could have went one of two ways dumpster fire as grayson put it <laughs> Or the way that it did. And so this was great. And this is also proof that although we can get passionate with each other in comment sections or over Facebook, things like that. But once we actually get into the debate octagon and we're face to face, then, uh, you know, we can really kind of dig deep on these topics and have a respectful discussion. So, Jamie, again, thanks for doing this. Appreciate it. Uh, some final words, final thoughts. Uh, yeah. First, uh, any evolutionists out there in the chat? Feel free to come out from behind your keyboard and challenge me in a debate. I have an open schedule, not afraid. Um, as far as my comments for the debate, um, it definitely I was expecting a dumpster fire based on our month and a half of messages. It got pretty hectic in those Facebook messages. So this went a lot better than I thought it would. We can turn um, those into like a novel. Grace and yeah. Jamie behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, behind the scenes for behind sure. Behind the scenes debate. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate you for, you know, keeping it civil, keeping it on topic and, you know, making sure we did one point at a time and all the proper responses. Um, also, I guess I got to plug my channel, uh, Studio 215 Official. Uh, go subscribe to it. Um, I haven't posted in roughly two months, but don't worry. I am about to post a lot more stuff. I'm going to eventually post all of these uh, debates that I've done over there. Um, I'm also going to be doing a weekly Genesis Bible study. So that'll be coming, um, I think, either starting next week or the week after that. Um, the other thing is that I am still doing the Evolution Exposed video series, um, but the episode three ended up turning into an entire documentary. I ended up going through and um, I wanted to do the human to ape evolution and debunk every single evidence for that. And no, I'm not just picking one or two, Grayson. I have about 40 different uh, evidences for human to ape evolution that I'm going to be breaking apart one by one. Um, so instead of that being just a normal episode like normal, it ended up turning into a whole documentary. So that's why I haven't been posting on the Evolution Exposed. Um, but I will have more videos coming soon in the in the next week or two. So for those of y'all that are subscribed, I will start posting again soon. And for those that are thinking about subscribing, there will be content coming again. So I recommend that highly. Well, Jamie, I appreciate those final words, final thoughts. I've got uh, your your link to your channel in the in the description box. Anybody you know in the chat, anybody who views this and they're interested in debates, whether you're on the creationist side or the evolutionist side, then you know reach out to me. We can set you up with Jamie. He's looking for more debates. We can set you up with uh, Grayson as well. He's always looking for debates. So Grayson, uh, I think you may have forgotten to plug your channel. Feel free to do so. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm I'm still a new YouTuber <laughs> getting the ropes. <laughs> Jamie, if after you publish uh the the next episode in your series, I mean, I haven't had a human evolution debate before. It's a super interesting topic. Uh I I'm definitely open to a human evolution debate. And um yeah, so my channel is based theory, based like the opposite of cringe. You can probably search based <laughs> theory after shows um and it, that'll come up in YouTube, but um yeah donnie's got the link for it i'm gonna be hosting an after show uh, immediately to follow this when we get off of here honestly this is a three-hour debate i don't know how long i'm gonna be there for the after show but if there were anything like you didn't get your question answered or you i said something that you really disagree with uh, feel free to join the after show and continue this discussion 
Grayson likes his three plus hour debates. Great. I think our last debate was about three, three and a half hours. I was recovering for a week after that. So, okay. Make sure if you like what you're hearing from Grayson and Jamie, our superstars for the night, I think they'll both be signing autographs after this debate ends. So please stick around to get those autographs from them. Could be worth something in the future. Uh, check the description box. You can find their uh, channels. Go hit that subscribe button. Grayson's putting on more and more after shows. And so that is perfect for 2023. <laughs> His after show will kick off shortly after this. I'm going to let these debaters get on out of here. I'm going to stick around for uh, just a couple minutes of reminders and announcements. So again, Grayson, Jamie, thanks so much for, for doing this. Okay, guys, uh, there we go. An another one in the books and another one in the books for 2023. If you're new to this channel, please make sure to uh, hit the subscribe button, but also utilize our website, standingfortruthministries.com uh, and also creationistclothing.com because we've got endless content for you. If you go to the playlist section uh, titled Debates Hosted by Standing for Truth Ministries, you'll find uh, over 275 debates on all sorts of topics. And so, you know, if you love, especially on your free time to listen to debates, because I find debates and discussions, as long as they're healthy, as long as they're respectful, and as I like to say, sophisticated, then, you know, we can all learn a lot from them. They're very edifying and it's just a great way to learn. It's a great way to understand various positions. It's a, it's a great way to test your own position. And so that's why we, um, you know, we, we strongly uphold critical thinking since we believe critical thinking is important. Studio 215 official, God bless, brother. Appreciate you uh, giving us your time for these awesome debates. Any evolutionist out there that wants to take the 2023 evolution debate challenge, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, Jamie's always willing. You know, I, I'm always looking for debates, of course. Dr. Dino, Professor David McQueen, T Rock, Nephilim Freeze getting back in the ring. So let's have uh, let's have a fun 2023. Let's have a debate filled 2023. So we'll be back here in a couple days. Uh, James W. and Praise I Am is biblical slavery morally good. Uh, I'll be doing a this will be more of an informal debate. Uh, myself and Chris Lucas. So a couple weeks back. I did an impromptu uh, debater discussion with Jamie Russell on um, his post wrath position, but also the uh, he of Daniel nine twenty seven. So Chris Lucas, a uh, good guy, he's a historicist, and so him and I we're gonna we're gonna discuss in an informal debate format the seventieth uh, week of Daniel. Has it been fulfilled? Who is the he of Daniel 927? And so I'm finding it harder and harder to squeeze in my own debates since we have so many uh, just debates, interviews, discussions on, on the channel. So this one will probably take place sometime in the next week. Again, it'll be impromptu. We're both ready to go. We're just going to, uh, you know, find a night where uh, we can message each other and say, hey, you know what? I think tonight's going to work. Let's have a two, three hour uh, debate or discussion on that. So that's coming up. That should be fun. And I've booked three or four more uh, debates in the 2022 to 2023 Evolution Debate Challenge Series. So we've got Kent here. He's going to be debating uh, Fox Official. Noah, this will be chapter two. So this is coming up at the end of the month. We've also got uh, Kent and... Uh, Brian or, or David Emery. So they're going to be debating transitional fossils. And uh, we've got a new interlocutor as well. I believe his name is Michael. Uh, I've just confirmed all of the details. And so once I get the thumbnails in, um, I'll make sure to get those up on the channel. And so we can have those advertised and the, and the promos out there for everybody. So again, a reminder, Thursday, Dr. Grady McMurtry will be here with me. Two hours of audience questions and, and answers. So whether you're a skeptic or you're non-skeptic and you want to get your age of the earth, creation, evolution, ancestry related questions in there, uh, make sure you're here for this. Send in your questions and uh, let's have some fun. Let, let's have a fruitful two-hour program with Dr. Grady. As a matter of fact, he was one of the first 
that I ever interviewed now going back almost four years ago. <laughs> so uh, that, that was the Google Hangout days. So we didn't even have StreamYard back then. And, um, you know, I had my old logo and it's, it's interesting looking at some of those older interviews, but he's going to be back with us here. It'll be his third time as a matter of fact on the program. So I'm looking forward to a show with Dr. Grady. We've got doc, uh, Dr. Dan Biddle coming here soon. Uh, the end of this week, I believe it is. Uh, this will be a presentation followed by an audience Q and a, I've also got Paul price. He's written on the behemoth. And so he's going to join me at the end of the month for a show refuting liberal scholarship on behemoth. And so that's going to be a ton of fun. We're going to be arguing, you know, in this debate community, you're probably familiar with people like, you know, Sentinel Apologetics, uh, Michael Heiser, John Walton, the Uninspiring Compromiser, aka in Inspiring uh, Philosophy. So we'll be engaging uh, in arguments from, from those camps or that specific camp. So that should be fun. Uh, Paul Price he, from the Uncensored Pilgrims channel. Him and Snake was right. They're going to be duking it out as well at the end of this month. Is there evidence for the existence of God? I'm excited for this one. We've got an informal discussion on the Bible translation topic. King James only question mark. Will Kinney and Dr. Stephen Boyce. So this is at the, uh, this is actually on January 28th, my birthday. So that'll be a great way to celebrate my 34th birthday. So again, January 28th and first week of uh, next month. As a matter of fact, we're going to have the uh, week of soteriology showdown. So that week, we're going to have Charles Jennings and Travis Thomas. This is going to be an epic showdown. Both of these gentlemen really know their stuff. They've both had uh, tons of debates at this point on this topic. And so uh, Travis and Charles, this will be first week of February. Lordship salvation versus free grace theology. What is true biblical salvation? That same week, we're going to have John Crawford and Merritt. Or uh, on YouTube, he goes by Crimson Air. They'll be debating same topic, but with a, a focus. It'll be an exegetical debate on John 15. And whether or not John 15 teaches uh, conditional security or you know eternal security. So that's going to be fun. And then we've also got that same week again. Uh, Lordship Salvation versus Free Grace Theology. It'll be a uh, Turretin fan and Eli Haytov. And so I'm pumped for that one. I've also just confirmed another, I would say epic, because I love the eschatology and dispensationalism related topics. So uh, first thing next month, we're going to be having again, two pastors. So last week we had an awesome debate that I highly recommend people check out. Pastor Matt First versus Pastor Daniel Eldridge on the rapture. The month prior to that, we had Pastor Matt First and David Preston debating uh, Israel, who is true Israel. And then uh, next month we've got on the 7th, I believe it is, February 7th, Pastor Matt First and Pastor Anthony Aquino. They're going to be debating uh, specifically dispensationalism and who are God's true chosen people. So that's going to be that's going to be a ton of fun. Um, and you know what? That's that's just a snapshot. So, you know, I've got some big announcements coming up in terms of debates. Just got a few uh, more details to confirm and then I can uh, officially, you know, announce those. And so I think we're just going to wrap it up here, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you again, uh, not tomorrow, but on Wednesday. Tomorrow, there's going to be some behind the scenes work going on. And so thanks for tuning out, tuning in. That was another three plus hour debate. Comprehensive. If you're not yet subscribed, hit that subscribe button and please share this around. We're on our way to hitting 13,000 subscribers. So with that, everybody, God bless and standing for truth is out.